like sacred groups and other vocabularies yeah 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 mm. so we define geography that uh, geography is what geographers can do and we can exactly we can do everything and see therefore it, see there it. is a joke there is a joke about geography then mm. geography's main concern is geogossipology <laughs> understand yes, this yes. Literary, literary word what Geo is that sir geogossipology geogossipology the science dealing with gossip is gossipology acha oh, geogossipology yeah okay. yeah so geo is a whole mother earth and cosmic sense the yes, word has yes. been coined by a famous astrophysicist under whom i worked for 5 6 years he gave okay. that word okay now geography is nothing like that that is geogossipology and oh, without geogossipology yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. without yeah. gossip you can smile you can yes Geography mm. having that sense of that. Great, that sir. Yeah, good mm. interaction between Dalen and yourself. See you, see you. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Let us see Thank that you, what you are going to make. Yes, 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 sir. Well, it's nice to meet you. So, Thank you, sir. Good morning, uh, good morning. Professor Timati. <laughs> So okay, um, we have uh, now maybe soon. I think Praveen will start. It is already ten o'clock, and uh, you all are welcome. So Dalen will start, and then Shikha. So it is just like if you try to use uh, Indian metaphysics and uh, old literature, Dalen means basement, and Shikha means the top peak. <laughs> so you see the two side now. Now uh, you have to decide where you are. Okay, yeah. and the rest also have to think that where they are going to start. So now um, I am going to hand over to uh, Praveen, and Noga is also here. Most welcome, Shalom, Shalom, Noga. Okay, so uh, I think Praveen, now you can start. Ten o'clock now. Yeah, right. Shalom, Shalom. Okay, okay Rajani, Namaste, Namaste, welcome. From Delhi to California, yeah. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank morning, you. morning. Very good morning to all of you. Uh, so, on the behalf of organizing committee, ECLA, uh, Banaras Hindu University. International Geographical Union and Indian Tourism and Hospitality Congress. I welcome all of you on the second day of 10th ECLA International Webinar, focusing placemaking, cultural landscape, and spiritual tourism. Yesterday, we had a wonderful session in the morning, started with the inauguration, then followed by very nice speakers, Today also they have joined. Daniel is here. So a small media press covering is also in our local newspaper. I'll share with you, but that is in Hindi. It might be in English. So today also we are uh, expecting a good session. And uh, just to inform the audience that uh, yesterday whatever presentations were going on, parallelly I was uh, my university was uh, tweeting. to all over by tagging the speakers and you will be happy to know that uh, 4000 people have seen that tweet which was on 10th ikla webinar so that was a good coverage on twitter so people are following us so as uh, our time is uh, already 10 plus so we are going to start uh, today's session session number 3 so to start uh, i think I, i'll request professor rana ekla president to kindly introduce professor daniel timothy so that he can start and timothy i have already made you co-host so you can share your presentation thank you so much professor rana pb singh okay thank you everybody namaste good morning good journal good morgan shalom so we are going to start second day session first lecture by delan timothy who is a professor school of community resources and development uh, wars 
so many titles, no big deal. But he's uh, something like uh, North Star in the tourism studies. In my opinion, if you have to cite three persons globally concerning tourism, philosophy, work, field experience, empirical work, you can say Jalen is one of them. Youngest, he's much younger than me. I old guy, but follower of Dallin. That is the another, you can say, my personal relation. And uh, he has been so kind enough that he wrote uh, forward to one of my books also on heritage, etc. And uh, old friend, he has visited the Banaras University long back, and still he has so live memories and all that. So if you have to say something academically, what I have mentioned, he's internationally well-renowned, well-established, well-visionary person in the study of tourism studies. But uh, his coverage is uh, so much. Difficult to say that he's strictly following a line of thought, but uh, he's taking something like cosmic, what I say in my terminology. Research interests include heritage studies, community-based planning, political boundaries, supernationalization, shopping, consumerism, peripheral, rural tourism, religious city, religious tourism, conservation, and dot, dot, dot. Anything related to these things and always he tried his best to come at a point that what is the conclusion? What to be done? How to be linked to the human service? And that is his quality. So you can find the, any of his writing that he starts something philosophic here and there, and then it comes to the practical problem. So thank you very much, Jalen, for always having that. So you have something uh, godly spirit in your body. It is not only Dalen. It is something special spirit in your mind. So a spirit of the place entered in the spirit of body of Dalen in that way I can say metaphorically in Indian terminology. In terms of just one sentence, I can add that uh, his publication includes 22 books and anthologies till date. Two, three are already in the press, okay? And more than 210 research papers covering so many different areas. And recently he tried to emphasize the less developed countries and how to serve the human being taking the whole idea of tourism. So that is the great, so I salute to Dallin for all this work and we all pray in Indian terminology to Lar Shua, the cosmic dancer to always having that energy, the whole body of Dallin, that he can always create, help, and collaborate in future. Okay, Dallin, most welcome. Now, please, you are requested to go ahead. Thank you, Ranaji. It's really nice to be here. I appreciate the invitation uh, to attend this webinar and to participate as one of the speakers. It's, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. So, namaste to everyone. And uh, I'm, I hope that you're having a wonderful morning there in India or wherever you might be. So again, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And um, can you see that okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and you, can, you can hear me and see it all right, okay. Yeah, both. Okay, so uh, as I don't have a whole lot of time, I'm going to uh, basically, my, my purpose today is to try to challenge you or challenge us to think holistically and think beyond the normative way of thinking about heritage and tourism, of which indigenous tourism is part of heritage tourism. So many of the same principles and issues that we discuss when we talk about heritage tourism uh, also applies directly or indirectly to pilgrimage and religious tourism as well. So today I wanna to challenge our normative thinking about what heritage means, what it entails, and how tourism consumes or doesn't consume her uh, heritage as, a, as an asset. So just to start out, to introduce a, a basic idea is that heritage tourism uh, or uh, heritage is probably, I would say, uh, the most consumed tourism asset in the world. Most tours, most destinations, and most package tours that are purchased, for example, um, have cultural heritage as either the core or an important element of, of the uh, tourism experience. Some estimates have suggested that almost 80% of all travel includes 
visits to places of cultural heritage. And as I mentioned before, in many countries and regions, heritage is the most important tourism product or asset available. So with that in mind, I would like to deconstruct a little bit about the notion of heritage and tourism and how tourism or mass tourism in particular has traditionally treated, handled, viewed, consumed uh, heritage. And so heritage tourism or mass heritage tourism has typically focused on the most iconic and extraordinary cultural sites, tangible heritage and ancient heritage. In doing so, it has ignored the less iconic, the ordinary heritage, and the, uh, the intangible heritage and the more recent heritage. I want to focus today on the extraordinary versus the ordinary heritage. Won't talk much about tangible and ancient heritage, or, or new heritage, I mean. A lot of countries, of course, have pushed hard to brand their cultural heritage with the UNESCO World Heritage Site brand as a means of uh, it, as an erroneous means, in fact, there's no proof that it, it does grow tourism, but there's a lot of misperception out there that UNESCO branding will, in fact, grow tourism. It may or it may not, but there has been a lot of push by many countries to uh, brand as much of their heritage as possible with the UNESCO brand. These efforts, this emphasis of tourism on the grand heritage, the extraordinary heritage, as well as UNESCO's emphasis on extraordinary heritage, which they just recently started looking at ordinary heritage, has led to what I call the colossalization or the monumentalization of heritage production and consumption. So I would like us to think about heritage in a different way. And this is something that I'm challenging myself to do, not just uh, those of you listening to tonight, this morning. For me, it's so if I say tonight, you know that I'm talking about. Um, so I'd like us to think big, outside the normal tour heritage and tourism box of what, what heritage tourism is and what heritage means, okay? And we're starting to see some trends in thinking about heritage. For example, we're starting to see more efforts to be truthful in selling the past. In the past, the heritage of the kings and the queens uh, have been, has been um, emphasized and sold and marketed and packaged much more so than the heritage of the ordinary people, the peasants, uh, the poor people, the marginal peoples of, in the world. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk about that again in just a minute. We're starting to see a growth in a desire for more authentic, objectively authentic as well as subjectively and various other uh, authenticities as well. We're starting to see a growing demand for more truthful and more authentic experiences in the cultural heritage realm. And we're starting to want to, to hear more accurate histories, the realities of life in the past, such as we're seeing in the United States with indigenous people and in the context of sl African slavery. As part of this new way of thinking as well, we're starting to see this motion called democratization of heritage, meaning that heritage is now, we need to think about heritage as not just being the heritage of the elites, um, the extraordinaries of history, but we need to start thinking about heritage as also important in the context of the ordinary histories as well. And then of course, that is the last point as well, where we're trying to suggest that vernacular and ordinary cultures and cultural landscapes are an important part of heritage as well that deserves to be uh, considered important and protected. But again, I have to reflect back on how tourism has treated heritage and tourism has consumed heritage. Again, it's focused on that extraordinary amazing heritage at the expense of ordinary heritage. So as a result, I call this the three myths and misconceptions of heritage. For tourism to value heritage, it, heritage has traditionally been extraordinary, large and momentous, very old or ancient and tangible. But then that, uh, that leaves me, okay, I, I skipped a slide somewhere, it's probably later, but, um, that, has, that leads me to the question, why, what about the ordinary heritage? Isn't it important as well? And we'll get back to that in just a minute. Why has there been a focus on this extraordinary, amazing, grandiose heritage of the world? Because it sells well. It sells very well in the context of tourism. People would rather pay a lot of money to go to India and see the Taj Mahal, for example, than a small village uh, with 
what ordinary people doing ordinary things. Not all cultures or people view heritage in the same way. There's a lot of cultural and even national differences in how heritage is defined, what it means and how it's valued in different societies. And so that has a bearing on which societies decide, decide which elements of their past, their cultural past to present or sell to tourists. Not all cultures consider their heritage to be important. This is a very colonial perspective and the colonial history of many places has played into this and has sort of led to this sense of um, inadequacy where a lot of indigenous cultures and uh, local cultures are not, do not consider themselves to be important. Not all peoples are empowered to share their cultures. There's a lot of people around the world who do not have the ability to share or not share or refrain from sharing their cultures with outsiders. And then some people will never be convinced about what is heritage or what may possess heritage value. And we'll define heritage in just a minute. We do see this in certain countries raised to inscribe world heritage sites. So here are some examples of pictures of the grand, amazing, extraordinary heritage that we often see at the, at the forefront of tourism, such as these ancient pyramids in Mexico, Teotihuacan, uh, the Forbidden City in Beijing, China, for example, uh, the Taj Mahal, clearly. I think some of you have heard of this place before. Uh, castles, uh, the castles and palaces of Europe, for example. And then even in the context of religious tourism and pilgrimage, you have great iconic symbols of places of, of dramatic faith and miracles that draw millions of people every year, visitors of many kinds. So this would be considered an extraordinary sort of place, as well as St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. For instance, uh, the Lord Cathedral and St. Peter's being major examples of the grand, the extraordinary religious heritage. So I'd like to pose this question. However, so having said that, to summarize that part, tourism has, mass tourism has consumed heritage that is great and fantastic. It has ignored the heritage of ordinary people. So let's, let's break this down a little bit. Whatever we humans inherit from the past and use today and something that we or society value as heritage. That is the definition of heritage. It's not my definition, it's the, the normative accepted definition of heritage. It means that it's an inheritance. It doesn't mean that it's a tangible building, that's only one aspect of it. It can be intangible, it can be new, it can be old, it can be um, great and it can be small. If we look at this pure definition of what heritage is. So this is a very comprehensive view and doesn't necessarily jive too well with the tourism machine. Although geographers and anthropologists and archeologists have known for centuries uh, about the importance of ordinary heritage. So given this definition, that basically whatever we inherit from the past and value today is heritage, then heritage must entail things that are not very old and not, very, not necessarily extraordinary. So we're starting to see evidence from many parts of the world that shows that consumers, traveling consumers are more interested in understanding the real grassroots local perspectives on culture and heritage. Everybody wants to see the Great Wall of China and everybody wants to see the Taj Mahal and the Eiffel Tower, but they're all, we're also starting to see this trend in people wanting to see the ordinary heritage, how people really live, how they go about their daily lives, the heritage of the poor people, the peasantry, etc., not just the heritage of the kings and queens. So this leaves us, and this slide should have been earlier, what about the ordinary or vernacular heritage? Does it have a place in tourism? So this is a picture I took in, in Great Britain on this side in 1782, nothing happened. And so I really like this picture because it really illustrates this was just on some farmer's uh, wall around his farm, and it really illustrates a good point to suggest that not every place is extraordinary. Not every place is, but every place has heritage. And so we have to sort of reconcile this issue of heritage um, being everywhere and important, but which heritage do we commemorate? Which heritage do we try to package and sell? I'm gonna give you a couple of quick examples uh, to help clarify this a little bit. 
in, um, this is on the island of Barbados in the Caribbean. And this is now a college and a museum, but this used to be the white, Brit white English master's house on a sugar plantation. Now, of course, this is considered extraordinary uh, grandiose heritage in the context of a, a small Caribbean island. But what has been ignored throughout history, the historical narrative and the heritage tourism that has focused on this extraordinary, extraordinary built heritage is the is ordinary and vernacular life of the slaves. So here you have this museum, this college, this beautiful uh, mansion that's been protected, this great house that's been protected, conserved, interpreted and sold for tourism. But if you go behind it, what you find is the slave quarters of the ordinary people, the slaves who were brought there uh, from Africa to enrich the white slave owners. And yet the heritage of the slaves is entirely forgotten. It is not interpreted, it is not protected, and it is definitely not packaged in tourism. So this is an example of this conflict between the extraordinary and the ordinary. And why is it, and I keep raising this question, why is it that we as thinkers in general very often, but why does the tourism industry then ignore the ordinary or vernacular heritage uh, in favor of the extraordinary heritage? And here's another example of um, ordinary heritage where uh, this is a fish smoking plant in a fish smoking area in Denmark very ordinary fishing village. Here's an example of a fishing village in a uh, village in Eastern Canada. It's not extraordinary, it's very ordinary, but it would probably be missed in a tourism itinerary, for example. And here's a bit of an ordinary vernacular landscape in uh, Myanmar. So I wanna give you another example of this conflict. So I was in Luoyang, China as a guest to a university there in 2016. And after the conference day was over, we were walking around in the historic old center of Luoyang. And I was with a couple of other professors, Chinese professors and some students as they were guiding me around. And we walked by a small shop, a very traditional Chinese shop. And it struck me as being a very fascinating and important part of the old urban heritage of Luoyang. So I said, I really like this little shop. It's so fascinating and it's such an important part of Luoyang's heritage. To that, one of the Chinese professors responded, it's not heritage, it's too simple. And I was really confused by that. But again, if you remember in the beginning, I said that different cultures value heritage differently and different cultures define heritage differently. And so as I've talked to several other people from this region of China, there's this pervasive idea that ordinary isn't heritage. Heritage is only extraordinary. And so there's a, a, a misperception of what is important. This is the little shop, by the way. And so for me, this is really interesting Chinese urban, old urban heritage. This is not a big supermarket. This is not a big shopping center. This is just an ordinary small store in a really interesting ancient Chinese town. But from their perspective, there's no way this could be considered heritage because it's too ordinary. So if we ask the question about this, uh, we're going further recognizing, protecting and commemorating ordinary heritage. Why is it important? Why do we need to reframe our thinking? Because ordinary heritage represents life on the margins. It represents the majority of the world's population, okay? Why is it that tourism and the heritage machine tend to focus on the large, grandiose, amazing heritage places? If we ask ourselves, what percentage of the approximate 80 billion people who have lived on the earth were kings and queens and maharajas and leaders? It's an, an infinitesimal small percentage of the population, and yet it's their heritage that is 99% of the heritage that's consumed and packaged in tourism. And so when we think of the democratization of heritage, how is it that, 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 that we can somehow protect the ordinary heritage because it really tells the life of the ordinary people who are the majority of the people, not the kings and queens. 
what this perspective does is it gives a voice to the voiceless. It provides an identity for those who are identity free. And it has a long history. And this sort of ordinary heritage has a long history of being relegated to the rubbish heaps, just like this picture I showed you here of the slave quarters before. So what I have posed this question to us all from a philosophical perspective. What makes this religious heritage more important than this religious heritage? Why is it that we as a society, as a global society and as a tourism um, sector value this more highly than this when they're both important elements of the religious ritual landscape? Why is this more important as a heritage icon than this? for example. And why is this more venerated and more valued than this? When in reality, we know that heritage is both tangible and intangible and living and um, not, not necessarily old. But yet we often, as I'm saying, we as a general global society and tourism often focus on this and this, and this, when these other vernacular elements are just as important, and maybe even more important, because once they're gone, then the history of humankind in general is gone. So what does all this mean? I'm going to conclude now. And I've been trying to be a little bit provocative. And hopefully, I've raised more questions than I've answered. That is always my goal. Heritage is not only about big and marvelous historic sites. Everyday vernacular landscapes and places are also important. And of course, this is especially true in the context of religious heritage places. Why is this the case? Why is ordinary heritage is important? Because as I mentioned before, it in fact is the record of the everyday people. And we have to ask ourselves, why is it that the record of the elites of society has always been more valued than the record of the ordinary people. During the current pandemic, ordinary places have been gaining importance. Again, in the context of ritual scapes and landscapes, the idea of local shrines. As people aren't traveling as much, local shrines are becoming much more important. And we're starting to see uh, evidence in Europe, especially in other places where uh, people, since they can't necessarily travel to major pilgrimage destinations, they're starting to focus more on local shrines and that veneration and valuation of local um, shrines is increasing during this time of, of, uh, of difficulty. So what else does it mean? It means that we're starting to see shifting market and demand for cultural heritage in the Western world at least as Westerners are beginning to value the past of peasants, marginal people, and ordinary life. Everyday common heritage should also be considered in plans to promote and, and pre preserve, but especially to preserve and protect heritage. In more traditional societies, the heritage focus is still on the extraordinary, the very old, and the tangible. What can we learn from all this? Well, heritage is everywhere. It surrounds us every day. It is not located only at specially designated tourist sites. New heritage demand is emerging. Like I said, um, I've got my timer on there. Like I said, especially in the context of um, uh, the Western tourists and the Western travelers and what they expect to see. They do want more real heritage, more ordinary heritage of the ordinary people. As researchers, as scholars, we also should be more open-minded about what cultural heritage is. Even if it is just an ordinary small shop or an ordinary small mosque or something of that effect, those are still important and shouldn't be ignored when we're talking about cultural preservation and protection. So by emphasizing the value of ordinary heritage, place meanings are made more democratic. It, that that um, spreads the benefits of identity, place meaning, solidarity, et cetera, to the grassroots level. Local people will begin to value their heritage more, creating a stronger sense of place, a stronger sense of solidarity, and a willingness to venerate the ritualized landscapes that is part of their commonplace landscape. 
So I think I'm out of time there, and um, I hope I didn't speak too fat quickly. And um, but uh, I will leave it at that. And I once again, uh, distinguished uh, participants, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dolan, for giving us uh, several skills, several perspective, and uh, too many sides. So what we say that uh, it is very important if you follow Einsteinian philosophy, that to raise the question is very important than to get the solution. Solution is easy, but to raise the question is very important. And you have raised a lot of questions. I have taken note of several such aspect deconstruction to reconstruction, geo-manifestation to cultural construction, locality, universality, then coming back to locality, ordinary to universe, universality, and then again coming back insider, outsider, and so many such a binary situation. The one thing I have to with very humbly inform you that uh, the time where Dylan is, that is a late light, and he has to go, what he earlier informed. So with the permission of all of you, please little bit tolerate and help me that we can give a few minutes time here now that some people want some question and clarification in short to Dylan, then no Dylan will be ready to help because he will leave later, okay? So may I now request if you have some short, to the point question, please. Okay. I have a comment. Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay, yeah. Rajrani Kalra, okay. Yeah, hi, I, I would say, Daniel, uh, Dallin, it was really very thought provoking. And I can, uh, you know, I I have been in tourism from last two plus years, and now it has really thought, started making me think, you know, all the places I have traveled within India and the places Who is moving us to move on a certain areas, you know, rather than leaving all these places. And I still remember when I was in Patna, Bihar once, uh, one of the person I met, he said, you know, there's one site here. Nobody takes care of this. And it's, it's a very historical place. And, you know, I said, is the government not doing anything? He said, no, they're all focused on, on the major places like Bodh Gaya and whatnot. And this was just being wasted. And it was just near his home. And it was all in ruins, some old Raja or Maharaja's house, but it was all in shattered, you know, it looked like a slum. So when you were talking, all those ideas were coming, but it's really thought provoking to rethink uh, the places, you know, which we go as a, a tourist spot. So thank you so much. I will get in touch with you too. Thank you, thank appreciate you. it. Thank you very much for the observations. That's really excellent. And yeah, I think uh, if you look at countries like okay, India, else? a huge country, there's too many tourism as tourism you heritage. You want assets. to say something, Dylan? Go ahead. I don't know if you heard my my comment, but yeah, I, I was I was listening. Okay, Dylan, go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, places where heritage is everywhere. There's too much heritage uh, to protect. They have to be a little bit selective. But I think yeah. places have this tendency to select the wonderful, extraordinary. You know, royal heritage over the ordinary heritage. And so that can become a problem because heritage is not like, um, you know, a, a forest that can grow back. Once heritage is gone, it's gone forever. Yep. It's all the marketing or I don't know. It's it's how we market them and, you know, and attract tourists. So thank you so much. We really yeah. a lot of good food for thought now. <laughs> Thanks. Professor Joy yeah, Sensei uh, from IIT yeah, Kapoor. Yeah. yeah, please go yeah, ahead, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Timothy. Uh, thank you, Dallin, for this uh, wonderful, you know, like a tickling presentation. And, and uh, I really appreciate the way you juxtaposed, you know, you make uh, co-evolve the ordinary with the extraordinary, you know, the, the little things, I'm not saying the profane with the sacred, but the little things with the very big things, you know, the micro, micro, micros with the big macro, you know, normally, our history, our patronage, the way we behave and prioritize, and it takes a bias and it goes to the other side. But I think in your presentation, uh, what has emerged is the other side. It's not an either or, uh, as it was evident in your presentation, 
but it's the two things happening together you know i mean while you go to varanasi which is a huge landscape but you also look at the ghat where you sit that uh, lady sitting with her small creative economy the flowers and the diyas and that's also a little bit of varanasi which adds up to the whole of varanasi again you know so that was beautiful you know i really appreciate the way you presented it and i, I i'm i'm inspired thank you thank you thank, thank you, you. Sir, i appreciate that thank you professor sen uh, same observation i just like to add what professor timothy said uh, during especially during the post covid time my house is within a village area and that village having a small local deity and uh, we always used to go a famous temple called hanuman temple the temple was closed but there was no closing of local deity so in fact uh, due to this covid and very nearby area no restriction of that temple we visited that, that local deity temple several times and that gives us so much peace and satisfaction and connectedness not only a religious point of view but also nature point of view so that is a, a, a special uh, uh, phenomena happened with us due to this covid but also this made us realize that small thing local thing normal things are also important rather than big and extraordinary things so that was wonderful to learn from you sir thank you so much thank you very much my my hope is that we'll all start just thinking more holistically like professor joyce and said it's the woman the woman selling the the um, ritual um, souvenirs is is just as much a part of varanasi heritage as the steps or you know the the cats so we often just focus on one element and we don't look at the holistic uh, heritage environment of the place and, and i'm right. i'm trying to Hopefully, for the next seventy-five years, I can continue to look at that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Very much. Thank you. Very good. I, I, so, I'm going uh, to, R R Ranaji, I'm going to stay on uh, as long as I can, maybe one more hour or something, and then I have. To okay. Okay. Most thank welcome. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Most welcome. Uh, now, welcome to all other friends who joined later, and now they are part of this whole discourse. So, thank you very much, uh, Dalen. Now, we are going to start the second paper presentation by Dr. Shikha Jain, who is founding director and visionary symbol of Drona Foundation. And Shikha Jain's wide experiences in cultural landscape. And heritage ranges from representation at international World Heritage Committee meetings to more than 50 World Heritage sites, conservation, museum planning, projects, and so many things. She has also worked in different countries related to National Heritage Board like Singapore, Malaysia, and China. Okay, at personal level, if I have to say two sentences. The one sentence is that uh, whatever age, education, training, I am not talking that. She is one of my two such inspirers long back when she was just young, coming in such a, but she inspired me to work on um, cultural landscape with pilgrimage concept. And she has published three of my papers long back, 20 years back, my first paper in the journal she is editing. This is the one point. The second thing I would like to say, this is metaphorical and manifestative in Indian context, we can say she is just like a lady with the lamp, like Florence Nightingale, that uh, she is alone, that is spirit, that is showing us all over India. No one can compare, let me say very frankly. I am widely gone through the literature. She is that. And that's why we say the last word is like this. Based on our Vedic context, yatha namo tatha guna, as the name, so thy fame. So her name is Shika, always at the peak. Okay, thank you very much and most welcome. Shikaji, go ahead, please. Thank you, Professor Rana, and thank you for that very elaborate uh, introduction. Um, also, thank you for inviting me at this uh, conference. I'm really enjoying all the presentations on cultural landscape. 
Um, and you know, the previous presentation uh, by uh, Dal and Chemati was really excellent. I hope mine would sort of continue on a similar note. Uh, I'm just going to start since I have uh, limited time. I will share my screen. Uh, is it visible to everyone? Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, it's visible. Okay. Uh, so my topic is really looking at world heritage um, and cultural landscapes. And the idea of cultural landscape actually, uh, you know, entered into world heritage because of these very reasons that uh, yesterday's speaker, you know, uh, Patricia and uh, Donald and what today's speaker, uh, Dallin Timothy were saying that, you know, there is only focus on tangible heritage and cultural uh, heritage and the nature part or the intangible part gets missed out. So this special category of cultural landscape was defined to actually incorporate this nature and intangible. And I find this category should be the overarching category, you know, rather than the others. But of course, there are limitations of convention and the uh, UNESCO operational guidelines. Uh, so my presentation is primarily, you know, divided into two parts. In the first section, I will talk about UNESCO definition and what it means um, uh, by cultural landscape, as well as where India stands in terms of, you know, uh, getting cultural landscapes inscribed under UNESCO. Whereas my second part would be that how Indian cultural landscape is, is a very, very complex and diverse uh, category. And we look much beyond the definition, definition of UNESCO operational guidelines to really understand our cultural landscape. Uh, so starting from the UNESCO component, uh, like I said, UNESCO recognized this need, you know, and it says that there exists a great variety of landscapes that are representative of the different regions of the world, combined works of nature and humankind. They express long and intimate relationship between peoples and the natural environment. And this was, uh, this became officially, uh, you know, they defined cultural landscape in 1992 under which the countries could actually nominate their uh, properties as cultural landscape, whereas the convention si was signed in 1972, when it only had cultural and natural heritage. So in the course of 20 years, it was realized that a category is needed that links, you know, nature and intangible with the cultural component. And that's how cultural landscape entered into this UNESCO definition. And they specifically under this definition say that it has to be cultural landscapes means that these are cultural properties primarily, but they represent the combined works of nature and man. They are illustrative of the evolution of human society and settlement over time under the influence of physical constraints um, or opportunities uh, presented by the natural environment or of successive social, economic, cultural forces, both external and internal. What is also important is that they realize that it reflects specific techniques of sustainable land use, considering the characteristics and limits of the natural environment they are establishing, and a specific spiritual association to nature. So all those components, you know, that we've been seeing in presentations yesterday about sacred groves, about the um, the Shakti uh, peaks. I mean, this all gets covered under this. Um, and uh, this is sort of the sort of the uh, diagram that uh, UNESCO operational guidelines and the norm, the manual that they have um, uses to explain that you have cultural properties and you have natural properties and this is how the World Heritage Convention had started and they realized that some properties have both the cultural character and the natural character and both characters may be outstanding. In that case, they become mixed properties because they are recognized one for their natural outstanding value and two for their cultural outstanding value. At the same time, they realize that there are some properties which, which is under the cultural landscape where the natural and the, the nature and the culture are so symbiotic and interlinked that you can't, you know, that's the value of the property uh, that, you know, it is the interlinking or the symbiosis of natural and cultural uh, or how the complete setting is, which is man and nature combined works. That's what they say. So that's how you get the cultural landscapes. Uh, which is an overlap between the two in some ways. 
they also realized, you know, by 2004, ICOMOS, uh, you know, did a gap analysis and they realized that there are too many cultural heritage categories, especially monument sites and group of monuments, because these were the three categories officially recognized. And they realized that there are other underrepresented categories. And among these you had, uh, which would ca classify under cultural landscapes actually, would be the nomadic pastoralist cultures, transhumans, agricultural landscapes relating to stable or other economic crops, earlier stages in farming practice or land tenure, uh, the sacred symbolic significance of certain natural features such as mountains, volcanoes, forest groves, vernacular architecture and settlements. So there was a recognition and there was a conscious effort by UNESCO and advisory bodies and the state parties to increase this representation. And just to give you an idea, today we have about 1,121 World Heritage Sites, in which 869 are cultural and 213 are natural. Uh, we had, you know, till about 2004, less than 50 cultural landscapes. Uh, but now this number has increased to 114. You can see the map. These are the cultural landscapes today, 114 out of 1121 of total World Heritage Sites. We would still say that it is less represented, especially considering the Asian region, which is very, very rich in, in cultural landscape. You can see in India, I mean, officially, we only have Bimbetka, one cultural landscape site, which is also a relic site, as I will explain. So, so there is still a gap and India realized this, there was an advisory committee in the Ministry of Culture, I was part of that. And there was a conscious effort when we revised the tentative list in between 2012 to 2015 to increase the number of cultural landscapes. And you can see that earlier there were 20, 34 pot, uh, properties, we had actually proposed, the entire committee had proposed 57 and uh, including you know you can see the increase in cultural landscape and mix because there was a conscious effort but of course the limitation was that we had invited all state parties all, all state governments sorry of within uh, uh, india and uh, the uh, urban um, uh, uts and uh, of course the limitation was to come from the government so even if we wanted to increase more and we sort of encouraged them gave them a template there were limitations in in certain areas which had indigenous indigenous management or which the government did not have uh, you know hold on so they but yet we were able to increase a number of properties and you can see in the tentative list today which is currently 42 there are still some from that list of 57 that need to come up but you can see you know on the right side how from 2014 there has been a sub uh, conscious increase in adding cultural landscapes there are nine potential cultural landscapes uh, that we have and there are two heritage routes which could also include this cultural landscape category um, getting into the subcategories that that are defined uh, under UNESCO's cultural landscape, they say it could be a landscape designed and created intentionally by man, which is like a garden and parkland landscapes constructed for aesthetic reasons. Singapore Botanic Garden is one property inscribed on that. I was associated in the process in some ways. Um, organically evolved landscape, and this comes under two. This recognizes that social, economic, and uh, administrative religious imperative and the link or association in response to natural environment. And it could be of two types, a relict or fossil landscape, which, you know, where there was a symbiotic relationship, but it is now uh, sort of frozen, or a continuing landscape. And the last one of the most important for us is the associative cultural landscape, where we see this powerful religious, artistic or cultural associations of the nature rather than material cultural evidence. And in this particular category, you may you need not have, you know, big monuments or, or any tangible evidence as long as the natural uh, attributes are there and the associational value is there. And I will just show you how India is stands as far as on tentative list and world heritage. Like this is an example of the man-made landscape, the Mughal Gardens of Kashmir, which is currently on the tentative list. They've just prepared a dossier that might be going to, uh, you know, to the world heritage for uh, further processing next year. 
So it's again one of the very important man-made cultural landscape where the gardens or the series of garden, it's a serial nomination of all the Mughal gardens and how it is set within the overall landscape of uh, Srinagar city. The organically evolved landscape, which is Dhimbejka, it is a relic landscape. It clearly recognizes that long interaction between uh, the hunter-gatherer and the landscape they had. And you can see it in the rock art in Bimbetka and Madhya Pradesh. It, it, of course, it is currently, there is no continuity of this. That's why it comes under the relic cultural landscape. So officially we have one cultural landscape in our list, which is the Bimbetka relic cultural landscape. The organically evolved cultural landscape which shows continuity. Uh, we have, you know, Apatani cultural landscape in Arunachal, uh, which is one that was placed on the tentative list. There is another one, Majoli, which has been debated various times because its outstanding value is yet not proven, but it's still on the tentative list of India. So there are, you know, all of these, but again, whether they qualify for the potential value is, is a process in itself. I'm not going to get into that. Um, the associative cultural landscape, which is Konchanzonga National Park, it was inscribed as mixed site on World Heritage List, has a very interesting story. I was involved in the whole process of, uh, um, you know, advising on the cultural component of this, which is actually the associative cultural landscape. And this site was on the tentative list of India as a natural site. When we did a review and we asked state governments to come and propose, you know, or on their list what they want or review the tentative list, then we had these local monks and, uh, you know, local people who came to the Ministry of Culture, uh, World Heritage Advisory Committee. And they said that, you know, it shouldn't go just as natural because we are very, you know, it, it means a lot to us. The Mount Zonga is, you know, our mountain deity. and. So, so they felt that the cultural component should be there, which is when Ministry of Culture wrote back to Ministry of Environment, suggested that it needs to be a mixed property, and it went back into a process. It took three extra years for it to come back and get nominated, but it came back as a mixed site. It was India's first mixed and you know it's a very good example where we we can actually appreciate that associative cultural value without um, you know looking at tangible monuments or sites that could be there but it's more of the natural components uh, so just to give you a quick overview of this 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 is a buddhist cultural landscape and i'm only talking about the cultural part not the natural one you can see how mount zonga is you know the mountain god that is uh, worshipped, um, and you can see the entire Sikkim uh, landscape, how it is represented. You have the mountain peaks, which are the gods, the main god or Mount Zonga, the lower peaks, which would be the lesser gods, and then you have the monasteries across the landscape. So these monasteries are sort of manifestation at the lower level, which again become like you know the sacred points for the locals. And on the right, you see the Konchanzonga National Park area that is um, inscribed as the mixed site. So sacred peaks, how the local, you know, Lepchas and Bhutias, the local tribes, you know, show this in their ritual. You can see these, you know, there is a bigger stone and a smaller stone that represents various peaks. Um, you can see another visual. So this is an ongoing ritual activity based on which this uh, landscape is uh, inscribed as an associative cultural landscape under the mixed site. And this uh, association was so important that even the British uh, mountaineers and the European mountaineers realized it. And Konchanzonga is one peak where, you know, they stopped right before the top, like it was not uh, that they would go up and conquer the peak or be there. And that is something that continues till today. So it, it's really a local value that has been appreciated a lot. But uh, now, of course, it gets recognized as world heritage and outstanding value. Uh, the Pang Lab Sol Festival that has been continuing since the 18th century which recognizes, you know, which starts from the monasteries below and actually, you know, they pray 
um, um, in various places, the sacred uh, uh, caves, mountain peaks, and the lakes. And finally, the uh, main uh, uh, final uh, activity of the festival is just near Mount Zonga, where they do the final prayers uh, in one of the spot. And similarly, inside the monasteries, you see this manifestation again of the peaks and the gods associated with each. And this is one example where you actually see the legislation following what people believe. So it was because the people follow people associated with the lakes and the uh, peaks, and that's how it got recognized by their department of uh, um, culture, which is called the ecclesiastical uh, department here, and it became a legislation which is today. So very excellent example of an associative cultural landscape and India's first mixed site. Um, this landscape, of course, our cultural landscape is something that is beyond borders. That's one point we need to understand. So you have the example of Kailash sacred landscape, which could be a transboundary between India, Nepal, and China. Of course, given the condition country and the political situation, it may never be realized, but it is definitely a cultural landscape that needs to be studied and you know, whether it's on the world heritage or not, or whether the countries decide to do their portion separately before it becomes a transboundary uh, in the spirit of the convention. Yet it is a landscape that is recognized by various um, communities, you know, Buddhist, Jain, Bon, and others. Another example where India is attempting a transboundary cultural landscape is a very broad one, which is an under project Mossam, which looks at how monsoons throughout centuries, you know, earlier times, uh, encourage the cultural exchanges. So here it is looking at Indian Ocean cultural landscapes across about 40 countries and how there were exchanges and whether there is a possibility of recognizing these. Um, uh, and this is the kind of exchange or that goes on in the rules. This is one uh, map that I'm showing from a particular century, you know, uh, 1800 and 1900. But if you go through time, uh, right from the beginning, you know, it starts from the human migration from Africa to Indonesia. Um, and you would see that uh, it, there are so many layers and so many cultural exchanges and so many variety of the coastal cultural landscapes that one can match. Uh, so this is also to say that, you know, the cultural landscape, like I said, is a very broad category. And in some ways, even UNESCO has really a dynamic landscape and it could come as a serial of cultural, a serial nomination of cultural landscapes or the cities, especially in case of Indian cities where the living heritage and continuity component is there, we could, you know, debate whether it's a cultural landscape or what UNESCO feels is they have uh, currently stated that it's a historic urban landscape approach. So your city is there, but you use a landscape approach which has similar uh, intentions to actually manage it and look at what, how it responded to its natural features earlier, which may have got lost uh, with urbanization and development. So this was about world heritage. Now to coming back, you know, to where India needs to look and really understand landscapes in totality. If we uh, look at interpretation in terms of faith and divinity of uh, natural forms, water, rocks, mountains, which we saw throughout all presentations, we can maybe, you know, in a very simple way, understand there are four kind of stages. The first is the hunter gatherer where your interaction with nature is there, but you are fearful of the nature. And that is one landscape already recognized like the Bumbetka landscape, which shows that kind of interaction with nature. Uh, the agrarian one, nature as guardian deity, which you could see both in Konchanzonga or even in the Apatani cultural landscape, you know, or, or you have some inscribed ones like the rice terraces of the Philippines, which are where you see nature as the guardian deity and there are trees. Yesterday we saw presentations, the sacred groves, which are worshipped. So it all comes under that. And, and of course, for India with its cyclic uh, view and all our seasons, if we relate to it, all our festivals like Lori or others are, are actually coming from these, uh, you know, where we saw Nature as guardian deity. 
the military landscape, which is currently, you know, with uh, my uh, particular association with the fortifications committee, we are looking at uh, the landscape itself, which is where it was, you know, the kings and dynasties, and there was the landscape was being used for control. And it was, of course, reinstated by religious forms. You would always see the king first, uh, you know, coming up with the temple that would be the starting of the city or his area. And then you would see the fortifications and the you know, points in, in, with, in integrated with natural forms on how to control that landscape. And the last one, of course, we see in our cities it is when urbanization and development increases. There is manifestation in city plans of this link with nature, but we are losing it more and more in development. So I'm just going to quickly show you how India shows these various kinds of landscape. We've already seen the Bhimbechka one and the hunter gatherer, the agrarian one. I've showed you some examples. The military landscape of India is, is very vast because of its physiography, you know, from the Himalayas on top to the peninsular coastal areas. So we see the land forts, forest forts, water forts, hill forts, mixed type, and across India. And this is a mapping that was attempted by the National Scientific uh, Committee of Cultural Landscapes and the National Scientific Committee of uh, Fortifications. It's a collaborative effort. And it's a research that is still going on because we found that there are about 4,000 plus fortifications and forts in India. And of course, to understand the landscape in each uh, situation is another challenge. But uh, we have sites inscribed, the six hill forts of Rajasthan. And if we really take each fort, it is a cultural landscape in itself. It's not inscribed as a cultural landscape. It's a serial nomination, serial uh, property of six forts. But one of the, the, among the attributes that were recognized in all these six forts was, you know, the living temples that continue to exist and the settlement, which is an important component. So there were these, besides the defense attributes, it was recognized that the Indian forts and fortifications have additional attributes which are linked with cultural landscapes, you know, which, which actually led to its uh, overall inscription. And you have the example of uh, Chittorgarh Fort, 340 hectares of land, where you would find, you know, the villagers would actually use it for refuge when there was any uh, uh, battle. For months, they would be staying there. Uh, besides its tangible heritage, uh, Kumbhalar, the hill slope fort, extending on the end of the hill. Uh, but you can see even today it has living heritage. You can see a settlement besides the temples and the fort walls here. And it has a tribal settlement that has lived there for centuries, which is recognized as part of the uh, inscription. The hill forest fort, again, having similar, um, you know, attributes. This is Ranthambore. Uh, the valley fort in Amir, Jaipur. Uh, the water fort. So these show the various... Um, you know, adaptations, uh, which are, you know, which is, you know, the rulers or dynasties did to adapt with natural forms from uh, water to hill to uh, forest as protection. And even in the desert area of Jaisalmer, you have an outcrop which was used for these defense purpose. And this is one fort which is recognized the outstanding value is the urban settlement which lives within, within the fort itself and the havelis and houses within it. Um, another example of the military landscape, which is I feel is one of the you know, best ones across India that I've found, which is uh, the Maratha military landscape. There were forts and fortifications built by various dynasties along the Western coast. Um, and Maharashtra is the state which you find 700 kilometers of coastal area. And you can see the blue colors. These are all coastal forts along with few island forts here. Then you have the pink dots, which are actually the Sahyadris or the mountains perpendicular. And you can see the hill fortifications that were created. And finally, the green ones on the Deccan plain are the land forts. So this was, you know, the earlier forts and further new forts that were created uh, by uh, Shivaji Maharaj to actually build a military landscape um, that of knitting the coastal forts, hill forts, and the uh, land forts to combat the sea powers uh, 
on one side and the Mughal powers that were attacking from the land side. It's a very interesting example of fortifications network and how it utilizes the landscape that exists. And you can see it in the images. There is one coastal fort on top and a hill fort that you can see. So it's, it's hardly uh, any construction that is required there, the minimal construction, but it's really the natural features that are used. And in terms of intangible association, it is, you know, these forts are still valued a lot by the Maratha community in uh, Maharashtra. And there are several NGOs just taking care of these forts or trying to clean them and maintain them. They are almost like pilgrims, I would say, you know, the, the kind of uh, association they have. And coming to, you know, the last category where you are more urbanized, it's more what we call histor historic cities. But of course, looking at India, there is, we saw so many examples earlier. Professor uh, Rana has already done extensive study on Varanasi, which is one I think would be, uh, you know, the best example of a, a sacred cultural landscape that is there. But we see it even in the approach that Indian government took for its scheme of Hirde, which was looking at 12 heritage cities, one of the first uh, urban conservation program initiated by the government of India where you see that cities are selected based on the variation in, in the uh, you know, uh, diversity of um, sac uh, sacred landscapes. So whether it's Buddhism, Islam, Jainism, uh, Islam, Hinduism, or Christianity, there are various you know, uh, religions which are covered across. And each is, it has a sacred geography, as we uh, know. I'm not going to get into the details of this. And it's already presented few of these cities. Uh, but uh, I would just like to show slides to show how the cities, even though they are urbanized today, but they uh, retain their cultural landscape component, the, the sacred job that has been talked about, even in cities like Jaipur, which we would call, you know, like a princely state, you see how the initial planning, the main axis and, you know, locating the Govindev temple, which is the genius loci of the city, was done looking at the hills on both sides, the Ganeshgarh or the Ganesh temple here, uh, the Shankargarh or the Shiv temple that existed before Daud, and on the left, the on the right, sorry, the Sun temple or the Surya temple. So to define the main axis, north, south, and east, west, and how on the right side, you can see even in its world heritage inscription, though it's a city, not as a cultural landscape, but in the buffer zone, we have ensured because it was this sacred geography that determined the pl planning of Jaipur city. So the buffer zone takes care that these hills, despite whatever urban transformations, you know, should be retained. And in some ways, you, if you recall, you know, the Carioca cultural landscape uh, shown by Patricia Donnell yesterday, where you saw a hill in between the settlement. It, it's a similar situation like that. But it is really important for us now, whatever we can retain of this natural uh, component, we need to do that despite what the, the, the developments that have taken place and sort of stop these in some ways so that our whatever is natural component is retained can be protected for future. Uh, this is a view that shows, you know, this is a view from the north side. The This is the main palace and the Govindev temple is just beyond. And it is the main north-south axis here, you can see for Jaipur, with the hills on the north behind. So you have this Ganesh temple right on top, which was one of the marking points for the main axis. And uh, lastly, I mean, this is one example I saw in Udaipur because one may argue that, you know, the cities are not too urbanized and we can't see the natural features. So what is the cultural landscape component? And I came across this particular experience in Udaipur, which is the city of lakes, beautiful city. I'm not showing any of that, but when you see the uh, visuals with the lakes full, it's a network of seven lakes. It's one of the, you know, excellent example of cultural landscapes. But here I saw, this is Lake Pichola, and you have a group of ladies, and I see this blue water tanker right there. So I was just, in one of my visits, I found this, and I was just surprised, and I asked the locals what is happening. And they said, oh, this happens like three, four times a day. What This was a situation in 2006, when they had a drought, and the lake was completely dried. So you have the lake dried, you have this lake bed and what is actually happening is a ritual that the 
ladies do after a death in the family. They do a community bath. And because there is no water in the lake, they've actually ordered a municipal water tanker and the ritual is still taking place. Despite the fact that all these people would have in their houses today, toilets and bathrooms where they would be taking bath daily. But this is a ritual ceremony and the place association. And despite the fact that the natural feature is lost uh, for some time, of course, today the lakes are full again, but they have to come back to this spot. And you can see how the cultural uh, associative value continues and they are actually using the technology or the current means to serve their current ritual. And this is an indication that we really need to recognize more of this associative cultural landscape component and design for that rather than for technology and development in such situations. Because the mindset of uh, you know, people is still, still has that associative value and it would continue the intangible value. Uh, hopefully that's the value that would sustain and protect our uh, cultural landscapes in future. So this is on closing, we recognize, you know, even as advisory committee for World Heritage. Yeah, okay, just one other speaker from you is a bit late, right? So may I request it? Okay, I'm just closing now. Uh, so this is the definition that includes cultural properties, historic tradition settlements, representing a living dynamic manifestation of the harmonious coexistence of cultural ideologies with the natural environment and setting. And this is my last slide where I say <coughs> that for a more thematic framework and a range of typologies too. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry if I overshot the time, I didn't realize. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Shikaji, for giving us the whole travel on the Indian cultural landscape. We started from historicity, visuality, understanding, UNESCO, critique, and our own vision from the Indian perspective. So we will discuss that issue after uh, completion of this whole session papers, and because that is the time for discussion. So now I have to move from uh, here to uh, the next thing. That is a joint paper, Professor Rajrani Karla and Dr. Kakoni Saha. So I don't know who will present. That is, uh, okay, so I think both are here. Rajani, who will present? Yes. Yeah, we are who gonna uh, do 50 50 if that's okay. Uh, yeah, that's our so, plan. So, who will start? Okay, who will list? I'll okay, start so, and then okay, I will. Okay, okay. I'll start okay, first, okay, okay. okay. and okay, then Kapuli okay. will join in. Yeah, oh, okay, okay. So, let me introduce uh, oh. two scholars together that is Professor Rajrani Kalwa who has been a student of Delhi University and later on shifted there, is specialized in urban and economic geography, globalization, spatial analysis, thinking, thought, geography of tourism, and with a special reference to South Asia. She is now a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies, California State University, US. And her collaborator, Dr. Kakoli Saha, she's having PhD from Kent State University and now teaching at the School of Planning and Architecture, Bhopal. So they together are going to present. The only humble request will be that please take care of the time because uh, due to time differences and uh, some people from US, so late night, etc. So if you can help like this, then the things will go in properly. Yes, okay. yes, definitely. Okay. I will, okay. I'll okay. not okay. take okay. too much of time. No, no, okay. No, no. Welcome, welcome, Rajani Karna to go ahead, please. Okay, thank you so very much, Dr. Singh and all the distinguished speakers and attendees. It has been such a great journey since yesterday and uh, we're very happy uh, tourist, World Tourist Day. And I'm really excited that, you know, I'm going to talk and I've been listening to such interesting sessions and they have been really, really inspiring. And Shikha just set the stage for, you know, what really goes through behind the scenes of our cultural landscapes. And Dallin has already talked about, it's not just important, the dominant one, but also the vernacular one. So without wasting much time, uh, I want to continue. This is a joint paper with uh, 
Dr. Kakuli Saha. Uh, she has been working on GS. She's our first author with me and Dr. Rachna Khare from uh, SPA Bhopal. And Dr. Kakuli will focus on the methodology as well as the GIS analysis. So we are going to talk about a geospatial approach to enhance religious tourism in India, a case of urgent city. Now, okay, let me... So the whole, uh, just a quick outline I want you to give. This is our Varanasi. Uh, it's in a very pious city, though we are attending virtually right now, and Dr. Singh and others are already there. So I want to talk quickly about the aim of the study, important significance, or religious tourism study area, importance of the study, uh, methodology, result, discussion, conclusion, and future directions. Now, you know, we are... If you look around, you know, India is a land of pilgrimage. People are tempted to go to India to attend several uh, spiritual destinations. And tourism today has become a very important service sector in developing economies like India. And it has been increased also by the influx of various foreign uh, tourists in the post-globalized world, right? So these are some of the images where I have been to, to Bodh Gaya, Rishikesh, and, you know, yesterday, I think, um, uh, Daniel was talking about over tourism. So I said, oh my God, India is a land of over tourism, definitely. And we de we really need to organize. And I hope uh, uh, people like Shikha and others are really working on, you know, different uh, techniques. And what we are going to talk about is going to add on that too. So India is a land of many religions. It's not just one, but around 80% of us are Hindus and the rest of the population constitute several other religion, right? So I just wanted to understand India is a land of religion and the government of India uh, has also emphasized the importance of tourism and, re and requested the Indian citizen. This was last year uh, when Pre uh, Prime Minister Modi said that, you know, before you go out, first visit within India, right? So what's the aim of this research? The research, this, the aim of this research basically is to address the issue of improving the universal accessibility status of Ujjain city in the context of mobility of a religious tourist with disability, right? So if I cannot go to a certain place, what do I do? Uh, I, I want to go to a pilgrimage and I have, it's not accessible to me, right? And how can GIS technology enhance religious tourism for the visitor? So when we start thinking of geography of disability, you know, uh, one billion people live with disability. One out of seven has disability. So according to WHO, around 15% of the global population live with some form of disability, disability. And, you know, sometimes we really don't know how if we are going to fall into the category next 20, 30 years. And women are more likely to experience disability than men and older people more than young. And we do have people in our family members, you know, they cannot go to a certain region because of their disabilities, right? So that's a very, very important factor to understand how can we make life easier for them because they all need assistive technologies, low vision devices, and so on and so forth. So geography of disability, I often call it God, G-O-D, is a very recent development to study people's geographical experiences of their movement, right? And there are two different approaches. One is the medical that, okay, uh, you know, this disability is a condition and I cannot go to a certain region if I have multiple sclerosis or whatnot. But social mode is one, it's, it's a... It's an attitudinal problem. Oh, Raj's leg is not working. She, she's so young. You know, she's sitting on a wheelchair and going to a temple. So that's the approach. Oh, my God, she must have done something bad in the last karma or whatnot, right? So that's the attitude. But rather the limitations on a person caused by society, you know, such as various forms of obstacles and inequalities. Now, who are the persons of disability? You know, as we all know, some problem with the physical, sensory, intellectual disabilities, or other medical conditions. Now, for example, let's say if I, I am a disabled person because my legs do not function, for example, and I use a wheelchair, right? Now, this is my impairment. But if the society makes me, disables me, and denies any human right, because an architect thought 
that three steps up and three steps down would make a pleasant entrance to a certain you know institute or a, a temple or the library to get an access right so that's an important thing which we really need to think so pilgrimage with disability is pilgrimage as i said earlier is one of the most important in all religion it's called teerth yatra in hindi and this is some of the images when you see you know people who are disabled the family member really play an important but what if you are poor you don't have access to it right and most of the sacred sites in india which are the most visited lack you know universal access now let's go to ujjain because our focus of the study is ujjain right so now ujjain is is in the heart of uh, madhya pradesh uh, the heart of this india i would say and it has been selected as a case study it's one of the uh, renowned hindu uh, places of pilgrimage in india because we have kumbh mela which is uh, i think i was checking it it's next year's going to be in 2028 april uh, which is the largest uh, you know spiritual gathering in the world held in four parts in haridwar ujjain prayagraj and nasik right so people come and take a bath here in the holy shipra river like in in haridwar they go for ganges uh and it's it's a hindu pilgrimage as 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 i told earlier you know india has 80% of the population who are hindus and many of the southeast asian countries also practice hinduism so they all come over so it's a it's a great pull for not only domestic but um, you know international tourist as well so it's also called the city of temples a town fallen from heaven to bring heaven on earth so all these you know um this was one said by kalidasa so i just wanted to show you uh, so just few pictures as well so when we think you know it's to i need to go to a certain uh, this particular sacred place because i'll attain moksha right so I'm, it's very connected uh, to a person's uh, you know belief system and where hindus are you know it, it's a, it's a really important it's a re really a sacred to go to a pilgrimage right so ujjain is located on the banks of holy uh, shipra river and the city is really decorated during that time and this is temples along river shipra uh, one of the mahakaleshwar temple in ujjain you can see uh, now if i think dalan stock so it's all you know your famous uh, uh, landscapes uh, of rather than the vernacular vernacular obviously we have a lot of creative uh, sectors which really come up but the government of india has done definitely a very important role but we want to assist them here so taking a dip in holy river uh, you know focuses that they're going to wash away all the sins now why is this study important well as i said earlier you know accessibility you know we have so many people who are disabled 80% of the population are religious are hindus and they want to attend to the sacred sites so this is just one case study of ujjain and we are hoping this study can be uh, you know implemented in other uh, cities all other sacred cities of our country as well as in other parts of the world now universal accessibility assessment has not been performed for any pilgrimage city in india using a geographic information system technique okay so this research proposes for the very first time assessing universal accessibility of religious tourist spot using gis in the city of ujjain right so what's going to this going to help policy makers in the field of both geography of disability and tourism to devise new policy lot of work has been done as i said in the field of gis and religious tourism but what we are missing is uh, religious tourism and gis in the case of india right so gis can be used to map accessible uh, public resources give information where is the restroom which is this able friendly for example there is a strong coincidence of functionality between a gis and human cognitive mapping a uh, research has been done mapping of disability uh, used to make navigation easier navigation of people with visual impairment and so on and so forth before i hand over to uh, dr kakuli saha to talk about the methodology i just wanted to uh, take one second and show you, i don't know if everybody is able to see this just uh, say me yes or no 
I hope so. Yeah. Yes. No, we are able to see it. We are able to see it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Now, if you look here, this is the planet Abel, and this uh, you I, I just explored this on the incredible India website. I loved it. You know, I was exploring what is being done by the government, and now Kakuli will focus on it. This is you know, what if I am disabled? No worries. You can go here. And you can, you know, take a city tours of all these cities. And if you want to help, you know, let's say you are in a certain area, you can be a travel buddy, right? So if you're able and you want to help someone, no worries. You know, here's one good chance to uh, put your name and send that, that, you know, if somebody comes to Calcutta, I'm ready. Or if somebody comes to Delhi, I'll be happy to show, uh, you know, India Gate, for example, right? So these are different uh, experiences by one of the person who herself actually was a was a child of a disabled parents so father was blind and mother was on wheelchair right so she said they never used to go anywhere to see places and say oh my god this is not fair something needs to be done so anyways with that i would uh, bring i'll share the screen and I'll invite uh, Dr. Kakuli Saha to discuss the methodology and results. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Raj. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Kala, for setting the context of this research. So now what I will try to do that how I apply the GIS technology uh, to assess uh, the universal accessibility and how it does help in that particular field. So the methodology comprised of four steps. The first one was the selection of road stretches. Uh, Dr. Kalra, can I go to the next? Can you please go to the next slide? Selection of road stretches. So what happened is that uh, uh, because this uh, particular research focused upon the mobility pattern of religious tourists uh, with a disability, so we mapped uh, the entire road network of Ujjain city in the GIS. And we categorized uh, several uh, on the roads into three categories, like stretches along the city entry points, uh, stretches along the city entry points to accommodation point, and uh, road stretches along the heritage stretches. And uh, a sample uh, was taken from each of the category. Next. And then what we did is that we uh, made a universal access audit checklist. Next. The checklist were like uh, in the uh, made in two categories, like city for one for the city entry points and one for the public realms. Public realms uh, comprises both uh, road stretches of city entry points to accommodation points and the heritage stretches. And you can see that both of these uh, categories have some unique indicators uh, to measure the universal accessibility. The city entry points has a reservation information counter, platforms, uh, lift stairs, whereas the public realm has uh, planned pedestrian routes, approach to building, uh, barrier and hazards. And the rest of the th indicators like uh, toilet facility um, and the uh, um, and the tactile guiding and warning blocks and the uh, uh, card ramps ramps are common. And each of these indicators had five to ten uh, parameters. And the third step was to actually performing the survey. And to do that, next please, to do that, the uh, we actually fit this entire checklist in the open source mobile application called EPI Collect. And the advantage of that, it also records the location of the survey point using the GPS. And the scores ranging from zero to one was given to each of the 
uh, parameters on the basis of its availability or partial availability or non availability. Next, the third step was like after performing the survey, the entire information the data transferred to the GIS platform and raster maps were created for each of the indicators. For example, if the city entry points has 11 indicators, 11 raster maps were created and then they were overlaid using weighted uh, sum overlay analysis tool in the GIS and each of them was giving particular weightage on the basis of expert opinion. For an example, uh, the, in the city entry points, the platforms get the maximum weightage okay, for the accessibility. So after, next please, after the weighted overlay, the final map has been uh, produced like this one. And this map actually showing the zones of universal accessibility in the parts of the Ujjain city, which covers the major city entry points, including the railway station and the bus stand. The Ujjain city doesn't have a airport. The Air Bhopal, which is like 200 kilometer from the Ujjain city has, is the capital and has the airport. So we didn't consider the airport as a city entry point. The city only had the railway stations. One is major a main Ujjain junction and another is another small railway station. The site four is that and the bus stand. So now what does this map shows? Uh, this map, one of the major advantage of GIS is the zone. This interpolates the data we create and it extrapolates the uh, it's converted it to the zone. So we get the zone, not only the points, the these points is accessible, that point is not accessible. It actually creates a zone and which includes the uh, inter-road network in, in significant localities, not the points, but the areas. So when we looked at this map, what we see is that the site one, two, three, which are the platforms of the major Ujjain rail station, the junction, falling in the high accessible zone. See the green color is for the high accessibility. And the bus stands in the, both of the bus stands in the site five and six are falling in the low accessible zone, which is showing by the red color. Now, next, detailed investigation, which uh, when we did, uh, what we found is that why they are in a low accessible zone? Because the complete absence of facilities like lift, seating area, ramps, tactile guiding warning blocks, stairs, and car ramps. So we, this finding we further analyzed uh, using the psychosocial perspective because when we are talking about the disability, it's not only the build environment, we have to look the psychosocial perspective of it also. So the existence of car ramp will not only help visitors with locomotor disability, wheelchair and crutch users to access the sidewalks, but it also provides them a sense of safety as they are away from the busy street. So absence of it may cause the sense of insecurity among them. Next, please. And also in the case of guiding and warning block, it helps the people with visual or visual impairment, both complete and partial, to orient themselves. So if there is uh, nothing, if, if there is no tactility, then they have to be dependent on other people. They are forced to seek the assistance from other people for maneuvering. And persons with mobility restrictions or sight loss spend much energy and orientation on details compared to the able-bodied persons, and which makes them very exhausted. Adequate seating areas in the railway station will help them to, you know, uh, to relax and during the transition. Next, please, which will result the enjoyable uh, travel experience. Now, this is the another map. We had two checklists, so uh, the, we have created two maps, uh, overlay analysis map. So this is for the public realms, which covers both city entry point to accommodation point and heritage sites. And we, uh, what this map shows, next please, the map shows that there are particular sites like bathing ghats, the sites which are actually the 16 and 
king those popular wedding ghats as uh, rajrani was mentioning about the kumbh mela so during the kumbh these are the major tourist attraction points and they are at fall within the medium accessible zone because why because they scored nil in the parameters like traffic signal tactile guiding warning block approach to the building next please now here by saying approach to the building we are considering the temples now uh, the scoring zero means those places does not have access aisle of adjacent or parallel to the vehicle pull up space the walkways are not of minimum width not made of non slippery material and also it means that the the visitor with disability have to pay greater attention on details and negotiate with hindrance large in both number and complexity and it will create a irritation or sense of annoyance among them which result to the back tourism experience next please so what is the conclusion that what is the point of using gis why do we need gis to uh, assess the universal accessibility of a part, uh, particular religious tourist spot because this extracted zone will help the city authorities to identify and priorities prioritize areas that are needed to be improved upon for an example that now the city authorities know the bus stands need to be improved buses can enhance the mobility of visitor with disability as it provides opportunity to board and alight along the city routes and it reduces the time access time to the starting point of a journey and the, so they know what to do next please and the next is the uh, road stretches which contain the accommodation points there are several good hotels have been created under the investment made during the kumbh uh, purna kumbh mela in 2016 in uchchan but these stretches does not have a planned pedestrian um, indicator along with others it scored zero in that particular indicator so lack of that will create a, a situation where neither the visitor can access um, the visitors with the disability cannot access them and it will upset the government's investment plan to promote religious tourism in ujjain city so what is the future direction of this research uh through the this research what we found yes, out that Kakuri, gis may, the main uh, advantage Kasana, of gis may we request you to kindly conclude yes. because we are already cross 3 minute exhaust. yeah it is the last slide sir. okay okay yeah, it is the last slide so it it has the flexibility and the uh, it has the scope also uh, broad so all the gis criteria that was set in it to assess the universal accessibility can be changed according to the city so this kind of uh, assessment and subsequent map making can be done for other religious cities also in india and which will increase the revenue from the tourism we would like to us uh, thank uh, and acknowledge the contribution uh, from the design innovation center project titled universal design innovation for heritage uh, for funding this research and thank you and and uh, if uh, anybody have any question we'll be very no. happy to answer them okay thank you very much and okay. we have already been, thank you very much and, and we have already and we fix that the discussion will be at the end of this session and we have also to adjust with the time lock so i am sorry that the discussion will be only at the end that was a special case because galen has to leave that's why that was just after the Paper. So now I am going to proceed and request Professor Jai Sen. So Sen Dada is already here, and my very good and close friend. He is known as the man of Sunday. Those who know little bit, one of the biggest interdisciplinary high tech and low also that uh, Sunday project. He is the man who created that, initiated, and continuing that. He has a long working experience with the various environmental design programs and the. Chief EFIT, Government of India, and UK and University of Tokyo, several such programs. One of his mega projects, is sponsored by Ministry of Human Resource Development, is already in the process. So 
those who are reading literature and uh, this whole project of interdisciplinary, they all know that Joy Dada is really giving joy to everybody. Joy from the heart, joy from the field, joy from the vision. And now joy from the Ramayana. He's one of the leading authorities now joined the International Global Encyclopedia of Ramayana. Okay, Joy Dada, go ahead, please. Thank you so much, uh, sir. Pranam to all of you. I think it's really a pleasure and an honor, uh, really a pleasure and an honor to be a part of this August gathering, gathering. You know, the, uh, this wonderful presentation by Dallin, by Dr. Shikha, and then by the last one by Dr. Uh, Kalra and Dr. Kakuli. Excellent, I mean, uh, excellent deliberations. I just have nine slides, just nine slides, and I'll go through them very quickly. And uh, I'm not addressing a crowd uh, who does not know anything about it. On the contrary, it's a very enlightened August gathering. So I assume that there are some others who will probably like to know a little bit. So India is a country which has intrigued uh, because of its uh, a wonderful position in, as a peninsula and as a triangle, as a divine triangle uh, in the Northern hemisphere, uh, sort of uh, juxtaposing on the Tropic of Cancer on both sides. And its river systems, its mountain systems, its coastal systems, uh, its uh, uh, various forests and other systems has really created a huge enigma. So this is point one. The other point is that India poses and forwards and presents a galaxy of ancient literatures uh, in the world, you know, starting from the Vedic traditions to the, the first epic, which is Ramayana which is commensurate with the Rig Vedic traditions because the sages of Ramayana are incidentally also the sages of the Rig Veda, you know, like Vashishta and Agastha, Jamadagni and uh, Bharadwaj and all the great sages, you know, the seven sages, the Sapta Brahmarishis as we call them. Uh, till about uh, uh, 50 or 100 years back, all this was not taken very seriously and it was assumed to be some kind of a storytelling, a mythology or something like that. But uh, talking uh, or listening to what Dallin had said, most of the sacred landscapes were not uh, raised and garnered and patronized by great kings only, but they were the places of people who have given up their life on renunciation, in a renunciation. Normally people who are not known in the, in the, in the fraternity of academics, or popularism or hedonism and form. You know, someone like Joyce in from IIT Kharagpur who gets a project from MHRD, a lot of funding. But they are all rishis, you know, they're people of realizations. They're hiding in some forest, some caves in the Himalayas, and they were raising this. So this is vibrant with what Dalen was saying. In fact, 90% of India's sacred landscape is all about the rishis, the rishi paramparas. And if you even look at the Buddhist caves, not in a single cave, you'll find a cave where uh, uh, if Joyson had done that, he'll probably go and emboss his name on the cave as an architect or an engineer and all that. So the history of India is actually a very impersonal. It's a very, uh, it's a very uh, unknown, unpopular, uh, quite unlike to what we are doing, doing today. Now we Twitter, we go on media and things like that. So I, you know what I mean. So this is a sacred history of people who are actually extraordinary, but they behaved as very ordinary people, you know, the great sages and rishis and the Aranyaks and the paramparas of India. It's only from Buddha, uh, India's message started reaching the international borders, Southeast Asia and even Greece, you know. It is believed that some of the missionaries of Ashoka went to Alexandria and Antioch, and we have done some research on that, but that's another story. So, with the advent of GIS, which was so beautifully said in the previous presentation and the satellites off late, India's sacred geography, cultural landscape, and what you call just not religious tourism, not going by the bounds of any particular religion, but going by the vibrations of the mountains, the resonance of the rivers and, uh, and the beautiful lush scape of the caves and the paintings and the yantras and the sacred iconography that you find either in a Ratnagiri cave painting or a hilltop painting of Sayadri mountains or in Bhimbetka or a north of a cave in Nepal near Bodhnath or maybe a cave away from Kanchipuram down south. India actually forwards and 
because it's a huge, rich cluster of sacred geography. The word sacred is not exactly the way we mean sacred. It's sacred by the virtue of realization. Dharayate iti dharma, because these rishis had realized great truths and some of their spiritual realization was converted into abstractions, either an art form or a textual form or an epigraphical form or some kind of an epic form. And then it became popular and it became some kind of a cultural continuity. So this is something that we have to remember about uh, India. It's not the sacred or the profane. It's actually the deep heritage, which is based on realization, you know, which, is, which, is, uh, which is spirituality, you know, where a river is a moving soul, a mountain is a moving presence, and the tree is a moving uh, expression of spirit, you know, like the way you have seen in James Cameron's movie, The Avatar, you know, the, the tree is so sacred to that, to that uh, tribe outside in Pandora, and we, the people of uh, the earth, by virtue of the material science, we think they are barbaric, they are not civilized, you know, that's the whole uh, message in that movie called Avatar, you know, you know, I mean, if we don't get that message, we don't get that movie, you know, we don't get the movie. So when we look at India, uh, India poses an extremely brilliant geographical system. And I'll go very quickly, as I told you, I just have eight slides after this. Uh, and Indian uh, religious uh, and spiritual systems are based on its rivers, of which the two rivers actually originate from the north of India on the, on the, on the foothills of Mount Kailash from the two lakes, Raka and Manas Saravar. And Sindhu, uh, which is known as Indus, and Sanpo, which is known as Brahmaputra, actually originate. So they are not known as Nadis, they are known as Nada, Nada, you know, the, the, the masculine part of it, you know, being from behind the Himalayas. Whereas all the other rivers along this side, they are called as Nadis, they are called as Nadis. So this is absolutely fantastic. And this creates the two huge river valley civilizations one in the Gangetic Plain of Bengal, Assam, Bangladesh currently, and other in Sindh, Pakistan, which is a very famous Indus Valley civilization. A lot of time and energy has gone into the Indus Valley civilization, but not much time has actually gone to the other side, which is the Sanpo, the Brahmaputra civilization, you know, which, which is there. But that's not what, what I'm saying here. What I'm saying here is that India has a lot of these sacred landscapes and in between, we have the whole, uh, we have the whole Indian subcontinent, which is the Aryavarta, the Bharat Brasha, the sacred land of the Aryans. And by Arjo, we don't mean a race coming from Europe or the central India, but a race which has not invaded as per the, uh, the pre-modern definitions of Aryan, but a race who has attained spirituality. So even if a tribe from Africa reaches Samadhi and is one with God and humanity, he is also an Aryan as per the doctrine of the Rig Veda, you know, in the words of Sri Aurobindo or Swami Vivekananda and others, you know. So by Aryan, uh, if you do a genetic study, we actually do a mistake because you cannot prove who is an Aryan and not an Aryan by virtue of genetic study only. It's by virtue of spirituality and the degree and the intensity of your embrace and your deep culture and your deep heritage. So wherever we have come from, whether from India, from outside India, it is only in India within the sacred geographical scape of the mountains and the rivers, the Arjo Rishis, the Aryan Rishis had created a thousands and a thousands and a thousands years of ancient civilization. So when we look at this, you find a galaxy, you find a galaxy of landscapes, you know, you find a galaxy of landscapes and they start from the Indus Valley civilization on the left, and if you look at the Indus Valley Civilization, you'll see that most of the rivers of Indus Valley Civilization are actually Himalayan. They don't come from the Karakuram, you know. So it's actually a Himalayan civilization. All the five tributaries are there, you know. If you look at the, if you look at the, if you look at uh, the, the 51 Shakti Pitams, you know, going by Shakti, God as the mother, you know, they're concentrated all over India, but mostly in East India. If you go by the, uh, Dadash Jyotir Lingam, the other sacred scape, they are concentrated all over India, but they're in West India, which is the Purusha cult of India. Now, if you go by the Divya Desam, of which Naimisharanda is one, Divya Desham, the 108 Divya Deshams, 
102 or three are actually on the material soil and few are what uh, Dr. Shikajin beautifully said, the Bayouns, the hidden lands beyond Himalayas or over the, the visible terrain, you know. So uh, they are also another sacred landscape and there's a huge concentration of the Divya descents in the Deccan, the Dravidian India. But, and the word Dravidia is uh, not non-Aryan. The word Dravida actually means Dravibhuta, which means Soma or Amrita, whereas the word Arya means Agni or Igneous. So Aryan and Dravida are the thermodynamic couples of the Agni Chroma and the Soma Chroma of the ancient Vedic uh, relationship. This, oh, this whole debate of Aryan versus Dravidian is a big, big, big mistake which has run through the Indian history and it has destroyed the true interpretation of Indian history. So we need new books, new write-ups, you know, something with Sanjeev, my friend, Sanjeev, Sanjeev Sanyal is doing, Ashwin is doing something. I know all these guys as friends uh, and Amish is doing some of these books. I've met them a couple of times. So we need an absolute reinterpretation of the Indian cultural landscape. And we did an absolute interpretation of the times of the Vedas which are commensurate with that of the Ramayana and the times of the Vedantas and the Gita, which, are, which is commensurate with the time of the Mahabharata. So if you look at the Ramayana, the concentrations are on the north and the northeast and going down south. And if you concentrate on the Mahabharata, they're actually on the west and going up to northeast and then north of northeast, which is Mahaprasthana. So actually the movement of civilization in India is actually not from the west to the east, it's actually from the east to the west. If you, if you think the Vedas and the age of Vedanta are like one and two in Indian history. So uh, there has to be a lot of interpretation that needs to be done. And this is something that needs to be showcased by the next generation. You know, someone like Raj Rani, you know, very young scholar, I see her right on the screen, you know, absolutely vibrant and so wonderfully, you know, speaking, you know, and even people younger to her, you know, so it's the whole uh, gauntlet is actually in their hands to pick up the real story, you know, uh, the wonder that was India in the words of Dr. El Basham, you know, or the speaking tree in the words of Richard Lanoy, you know, Kalpataru, which is India. I'm not trying to sell India or promote India, but it's a story which has not yet been told. And it's somehow uh, we are dependent on books which has already been written by a certain perspective by scholars driven by a certain agenda or a certain viewpoint. There's nothing wrong with that, but the other agenda is missing. So given this, the, given this, one of the greatest uh, turning points that came, which was there in the Mosumi slide of Dr. Shikha Jain, is about 40 or 35 years back when the French ice spot satellites were coming right over India and trying to study the Indian peninsula and see the contribution of the Indian Peninsula to the making of the whole uh, uh, Indian climate and the world climate as a whole. Then Dr. A.S. Bishit and others uh, uh, of the ASI and others from the Deccan School of Engineering, they saw something else, you know, and, uh, and the French people almost concluded because the French are always good friends of the Indians historically, you know, starting from Voltaire, starting from Voltaire to Laplace, the great mathematician. Uh, they, they say that Indian Peninsula is almost responsible for about 66% of the global climate. And if India was not of this shape, this, this peninsula or that bar, the triangle, the divine triangle, if you call it divine, or, or if you don't call it divine, it doesn't matter. There is also something else that they discovered and they, and they discovered something that the most of the concentration of the Indus cities was actually not on the Sindhu Nadi or the Indus River, but it was on a river that is coming from the Himalayas farther east. And incidentally, there was a lot of debate and things like that. And the debate is still on. And this was somehow identified with the Saraswati note, uh, river of the Rig Veda. You know, Rig Veda, the debate is still on. Now, Saraswati is just not the name of a single river. Whenever two other rivers come and come together, it becomes a Saraswati. So there is a Saraswati of the Indus. In Varanasi, the Ganga is actually not bound Uttar Bahini. So the Ganga is actually a Jamuna. And the sadhana that you do in Kashi is known as Saraswat sadhana. In Bangladesh, you have Meghna and Jamuna, you know, the two tributaries of uh, Ganges and Brahmaputra. When they meet, they form another Saraswati, which is Padma, the river of Lotus of Goddess Saraswati. 
and there is a Saraswati in the Kaviri basin based on which the Varanasi of the South, this is which Kanchi is founded. So this is absolutely impersonal and universal. So Saraswati is not the name of a single river. It's actually the name of a spiritual current, which can also be in the body of the yogi, you know, the, the spinal cord itself through which the yogi attains Nirvana and Maha Nirvana, Siddhi and Maha Siddhi, you know. So this is, uh, this is something uh, that needs to be in a positive. So we need a, we need a composite. Uh, uh, so we need archeology span with spirituality, we need epigraphy with GIS, we need architectural semantics and semiotics with uh, mythology and you need, uh, you need satellite science with storytelling and writing storybooks for young children. You know, that's the need of the day. So I talked to Michelle, who is an advisor of our science and heritage uh, advisor. Michelle happened to be uh, one of the disciples of Mother Mira Alfaza, mother of Pondicherry. And uh, Michelle is very dedicated to the Indian cause. And Michelle wrote this book about uh, 35, 40 years back, The Invasion That Never Was. There's nothing called the Aryan Invasion. And then he wrote the second book. I'm not trying to place Michelle here. What I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of text and new books and new ideas, which is redefining the cultural landscape of India, the deep cultural landscape of India. And this, this needs to be garnered and pushed into the forward scape of India. And uh, Dr. Rana Pratap Singh, he's my dada guru. You know, he's like my, I don't know how to describe him. You know, he remembers everything. You know, my students, my PhD students, you know, uh, I mean, he's like the Dada Moshe. In Be I'm from Bengal, so in Bengal we have a word like Dada Moshe. You know, when Shottaytra makes a movie, uh, he, he has a, a character called Shidu Jatha. You know, who knows everything? So Dr. Rana is one of such person, and you know, he's that one everything of Varanasi. I'm not trying to eulogize him or pamper him. What I'm trying to say is that you need more Dr. Ranas in the future. You know, persons of patronage. You know, person who are open to so many things. And he loved our work under the Science and Heritage Initiative, which is Sandhi. And uh, only a little work has been done. So you can look at this website, which is OCCR. And if you're interested, have a look at some of our publications. They are just very uh, initial publications. And we, have, we are making storybooks for children. And we are also beginning to make movies for children very soon. You know? So this is, we cannot do everything. So we need all others from all across the world to take this whole onus. So with this, I'll go to the next slide. So if you look at Indus, where a lot of uh, uh, thing has been done, in fact, a true interpretation of the Indus Valley civilization has not yet done. If you look at the house of Indus, a little home, this is what architect Prisca Price owner, B.V. Doshi has done in his Aranya housing, you know, sort of uh, following the architecture of Indus, you know, which, which is as modern, even if you today, if you design a house, uh, you'll do something like this. And if you look at the courtyard, what we call the modern idea of placemaking today had actually existed in Indus. And if you look at the brick bonding of Indus, much before the English people came to, to India, the Indus Valley people are actually working with English bond. So English bond was actually an Indian bond or an Indus Valley bond. You know, there's nothing called the English bond and everything almost in Indus Valley civilization is based on India. So I think we did books and reinterpretation of our heritage of materials, heritage of construction, heritage of continuity, and uh, an absolute readdressal. So it has a fantastic, so it, it has a continuity with a Buddhist stupa or, or some kind of a later temple with a college of Christ. So the center of the Buddhist stupa, which is about 400 BC, sits with the center of the college of Christ, which is about 3400 BC. So if that is true, that means there was a direct continuity between the Indus Valley age and the Buddhist age. There was no end to that civilization. And today about 45 symbols of the Vedic civilization, including the swastika and the Saptamatrikas and others has been discovered in Indus Valley civilization, which says, which proves that even if the Aryans had come from outside, the Vedic civilization was already there in India. So who is these Aryans who came and invaded and learned things from the Indus Valley people and became Aryans? So it shows that the Indus Valley people were actually the true Aryans and they were congruent with the Vedic civilization. So there are lots of arguments and it's like a new Pandora, you know, which needs to be re-explored. Uh, so if you look at a much later age and, uh, and, uh, and if you look at that the, from the times of uh, uh, Mahavira, the Tithankara and Buddha, they almost existed at the same time. 
to the time of Shankara, India gets a little organized and Adi Shankaracharya organizes India as for the sacred geography. You know, he starts from Shingredi with the Shukla Jajur Veda, you know, goes to Sarada with the Sam Veda, goes to Govardhan Puri with the Rig Veda and finally comes to the Himalayas uh, uh, with the Atharva Veda. And the center is actually Vindu Achalam, which is Vindhyachalam, which is just south of Varanasi. So this is absolutely a non-GIS GPS configuration that Adi Shankaracharya did almost 2000 years back. This is fantastic. And today you can actually plot it on a GIS portal with all the coordinates. And he was just not an organization, but he was also a geographer. You know, he was organizing India based on sacred geography. And there's so much of sacred geography that we need to understand and follow. I'm just giving, giving you a little glimpse and there are hundreds of stories like this. And, uh, and we need classes, our history of architecture courses in the schools and colleges need, needs to talk on this. So this is what Ranaji was talking about. So the 16 Mahajanapadas, which is a part of uh, the Anguttara Nikaya of Buddhism and the Bhagavati Sukta of Jainism and also some of the Hindu texts, because at the time of Buddha, there was nothing like Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism. It was all a later creation. Buddha himself hated the word Hin Buddhism and all the Indian rishis will hate the word Hinduism because the word Hinduism actually comes from the word Sindhu and the Persian could not pronounce S, so they called it Hindu. And that's why the region came to be known as Hindustan. So it has got nothing to do with religion. It's a geographic word. But if you go to the, if you go to the Ramayanas, if you go to the Ramayanas, you'll see that the 16 Mahajanapadas are beautifully described in the Kishkinda Kanda. And this Marutis, you know, this Maruti cards, they go north, south, east, and, and almost to the end, almost to the end. Uh, and uh, you'll see that whoever the author was, whoever the author was, uh, he was fantastic with sacred geography. And if you go east, when the, when the Maruti or the Vayu Senas are going east, I have checked with my friends in geography, and just yesterday, Ranaji knows him very well. Uh, Professor Obhijit Mukherjee, he got the Santi Sarup Hartnagar Award. He's working on uh, Varanasi under the Science and Heritage Initiative. So Obhijit and I, we have talked about it again and again, and we have found out there is a fantastic description of Japan right in the Ramayana. And it just coincides with uh, the Asia Pacific and Japan, which is there in the Ramayana. If you don't believe with me, open up Kishkinda Kanga and see how the uh, Maruti Senas are going far east. And they, then they describe that. And possibly there's some descriptions about the, the Straits of Gibraltar and some, something about Atlantis on the Western Front. So this is absolutely fantastic. And so the sacred geography of India was so huge and so large and so old. And this is something uh, so what is the science behind it? And this is something which uh, Rig Veda, you know, the Urdha Mulam and other Shakam, you know, the roots above and the branches below, you know. So the sun world is above and the branches are below. That's a human body. But for the trees, the roots are below and the branches above. So when Buddha is actually sitting, when Buddha is actually sitting over under the tree is actually a composition of that. And this is beautifully shown in the movie called Avatar, you know, Avatar, you know, the sacred divine neuron, the, Div, the Divva Paramanu, Divva Paramanu. And even James Cameron uh, uses the word Nabhi and Kaya and Turak, Tarak. You know, these are all Indian, Tibetan, Buddhism words which are used in this movie. And this is also part of modern science which is called dendrogram and statistics and database management. So a lot of uh, information science and artificial intelligence softwares and algorithms will probably help to decode and bring forward the ancient sacred scape that is both a gift of the tantras and also the Rig Vedas and on. This is almost my last slide. And this is where the science of sacred geography remains, which is from inner realization. And this is biotechnology or physio deep physiological neural sciences, also connected with noetic sciences, Kirlian photography and oral sciences and things like that. So, th uh, so this is almost my end. And a discussion of this order had happened almost a little more than 100 years back in Chicago after the Parliament of Religions, uh, when Swami Vivekananda met three great electrical scientists of the world, Nikola Tesla, Lord Kelvin, 
and uh, Harman Helmholtz, and they have discussed about the role of electromagnetic vibration and free energy and wireless communication. That probably is the secret of understanding the whole cosmos. And through that, the real truth of Indian sacred geography will, will one day be proved as an ancient science. So, so I, I, have not, I have not said anything about this last slide. I'm just pointing out an immense possibility. I'm po talking about an immense possibility through which one day through the science of quantum electromagnetism, you know, John Wheeler, Richard Feynman, and post Feynman era, you know, John Kramer and others, India's spirituality will be proved. You know, something which Heisenberg and Oppenheimer and uh, Schrodinger already said in a very small way will one day be proved and India's sacred geography based on deep heritage will be proved as a huge science in the whole world. And that is the time that scholars and uh, who want to practice meditation will come from all over the world to India in search of the ancient land of spirituality. That is the golden age. That's the only hope. And I'm sure everybody has that hope. So I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jai Dada, for uh, giving all this uh, whole travel. It started from the ancient route of Ramayana and then going to the future cosmos and at the end linking with Swami Vivekananda. So really you have given joy to everybody. Joy not to be translated as pleasure. Joy to be translated as ananda. Sublime bliss. So again to close your lecture by the words of Swami Vivekananda who has concluded his first lecture on 13 uh, September uh, 1863 at Chicago, World Parliament. Oh, my people, arise, awake, stop not till the, you get the goal. So here is the spirit of uh, that uh, provoking and challenge what Vivekananda ji has given. The same thing Jai Sen has given to us. So it is the duty of the young generation not to listen. This is not a lecture. No way in my view this is a lecture. This is a challenge, awakening and inspiration. And those who are smiling faces of young generation, they can realize this. So this is a quest for self-realization. Okay, Atma Chintan Se Atma Vivechan Ki Yor Chale. Thank you very much, Dada, for this. And uh, we are already Pranam linked Pranam to Pranam 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 At two stages, we are linked. One is uh, the Sunli project. He had given me this honor that first paper, introductory paper on Banaras based on the Sunday project, I published long back. That is his initiative. Second thing was that we are working together in the global encyclopedia of Ramayana. He is high tech man, I am low tech man. He is man of remote sensing, I am man of intimate sensing. So that is a Sunday. Thank you very much. So now we are proceeding to next one. And uh, that is, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Professor Ashwini Pethe from the uh, School of Architecture, MIT University, Pune. Her particular research interest is in understanding sacred geography of Kulu Valley, in Lower Himalaya. She received uh, the coveted INTEC scholarship for preparing a religious cultural atlas of Kulu Valley. And she is collaborating with uh, my good friend, uh, Professor Kiran Sinde. So that is a joint article prepared together, but they have a long association. I remember when I visited Pune, I met. So recently I was talking to Ashwini and then she said not to introduce. I remember you, you are giving lecture when I was a student. So that, that is the old memory going to be revived. And uh, yeah, that is a good thing that both are now present here. Kiranji is here and uh, Ashwini. So now I am requesting uh, Ashwini Pethe, please present your uh, Lecture. Okay. Yes, sir. So, am I audible? Yes, yes, please. Yes, yes, go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, is my screen visible? Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, it's visible now.
uh, yes. Uh, namaskar. Good morning, everyone. I extend my heartfelt gratitude to uh, ACLA and especially Rana Singh Ji for giving me this opportunity to present this work on this August uh, platform. Uh, this paper titled as Pooch as a significant institution for maintaining the cultural landscape of Kulu Valley is co-authored by Dr. Kiran Shinde, who was also my PhD supervisor. I begin this presentation with an inquiry question followed by introduction to the land, the gods and the people. Then I deliberate on the shamanism as a ritual of communication. The discussion on the case of Himalayan ski project followed by community mobilization brings out the concept of religious governance. And this leads to the discussion on maintenance and conservation of the cultural landscape in the Kulu Valley. In 2006, Himachali newspapers were filled with several stories of divine intervention, which said two devtas have struck down the Himalayan ki ski village project in Kulu Valley. And this was, this project was about 2200 uh, 2, crore worth, which proposed to set up ski track, 300 villas, 700 hotel rooms in star hotels, with entertainment facilities, over 113 acres of built-up area, a helipad, and so on. The power of div the divine intrigued me when I realized that the fate of a large-scale economic proposal could be in the hands of Devta. And I started inquiring about the role of Devta in striking this project. I wondered how and why he is doing that. It is important to know the context of the land, the gods, and the people in order to understand the above phenomena. The Kulu Valley is located in Himachal Pradesh in India, in the lower Himalayan ranges. I call it Kulu Valley and not Kulu District, as the administrative boundaries may not necessarily coincide with the cultural and religious territories in the valley. As you can see in the map, the Kulu Valley is formed by River Bias and its tributaries Tirthan and Parvati. Bound on northern sides by Pir Panjal, Dauradhar, and Barabangal ranges. This valley is dotted with innumerable village deities uh, called as Devtas and hence known as land of gods. These Devtas are believed to be living deities who run, walk, have emotions, and also communicate with people through various means. Now, let us understand the concept of Devta in Kolu Valley. The numerous devtas in the Kulu Valley mark its omnipresence in the entire landscape. In rural areas of Kulu, devta is carried outside in the landscape on certain occasions for darshana or for yatra. And people do not visit temple for darshana in this particular rural area. Devta moves in the landscape on certain occasions like festivals, fairs, yatras, and also visits other sacred places and houses. The physical manifestation of Devta is a mohra, which is a pressed face image in gold or silver kept in a basket. Sometimes pindi, a vertical stone, or any nishan like a bell, flag, etc. are also revered. There are various cults such as Atra Kardu, Atra Nag, Rishi, Veer, Asura, Jogini, Jamalu, etc. There are more than 15. Classical deities are not considered in this study as these local deities are believed to have power over the landscape. Out of the above, I, mentioned, I mapped three cults in detail and this map, this map on right side shows one of the cults of Athara Kardu. This cult has its own mythological origin that has also been mapped, but it's not part of this uh, presentation. Just to mention here is a study uh, he, uh, he, uh, mentioned here, this study was carried out during uh, during two, two, 20, uh, 2012 and 2016. Field work was carried out in and around 18 villages, which involved mapping, in-depth interior uh, interviews to record oral histories and participant observations. These Athara Kardus are found to be located near river, Nal, hot springs or into the uh, or into the deep forest and on high mountains now let us focus in this particular region uh, in the map where maximum number of devtas are present just a moment the slide is not changing Uh, 
Okay. While mapping these curls, I came across the concept of Devta Kshetra. One Kardu Devta administers smaller Devtas in the surrounding village and thus creating its own Kshetra or religious territory. These orange areas and dots, uh, these show how Devta Kshetra of each area uh, is organized. Some Devta Kshetras are as big as nine villages. Further zooming in, it, uh, in this particular slide, uh, it shows the nine villages under the uh, Devta Kshetra of Jeev Narayan uh, at Jana. Further focus shows on the settlement of Jana, where uh, I show the temples and the Gram deities and the uh, uh, sacred room is seen here. Now, this is the basic administrative structure in this valley. There is a three-tiered religious authority. Lord Rakunachi in uh, Kulu, that is the supreme authority. Then the village deities ruling the Devta Kshetra, also known as Bada Devtas, uh, who, who rule this Devta Kshetra of, of surrounding villages. And then the village deity, which is individual village, uh, which is a um, um, Chota Devta or Gram Devta. Thus, it shows a single village with ruling deity and the cluster of villages called Devta Kshetra. Many such Devta Kshetras are found in the landscape and are interdependent on each other. And further, the supreme authority of Lord Raghunaji at Kulu. The study reflected, this particular study after mapping, it reflected an administrative structure from unit to regional level. And since time unknown, every villager who is using, uh, uh, who is using the land for cultivation had to offer um, part of his yield to the village deity as it was believed that the land belongs to the devta. We cannot hold the land but can cultivate or use it. The smaller deities offer part of their crop produce to Bada Devta and later uh, uh, since 1651 the Bada Devta started offering a part of uh, uh, their of, uh, uh, produce to Raghunaji and in return all these devtas would safeguard and monitor the landscape. Now here, I come up with a framework to understand religious activity. The religious rituals are here and are monitored by religious institutions. In this chart uh, on the right side, it shows um, religious beliefs emerge out of some fear of nature as supreme or unknown, uh, depend on good or bad or rep uh, and repeated experiences of people and are supported with astronomical knowledge, philosophy, mythology, and folklore. To cater to these beliefs, rituals emerge as a solution, which is abstract and metaphoric. These involve agent, these involve an activity, and these could be manifested as daily practices, festivals, yatras, uh, sacrifices, and shamanism. Religious institutions come up uh, uh, and are manifested as tangible and intangible elements in the landscape, such as temples, trust, shamans, etc. Based on this understanding, I enter the area of shamanism called as Pooch in the Kulu Valley. Meaning of Pooch is to ask or to seek, to ask Devta, and the shaman is called as Gut. The pooch, is uh, the pooch to establish a communication with Devta is carried out in various ways. It's either possession by Devta or some religious acts uh, during festivals or during yatras. Uh, it is done during Devkil and it is uh, like properly planned pooch. Both these images are from Fagli festival at Goshal, one of the Athara Kardus. Uh, they have a practice of sieving earth with a cloth and then creating a dough out of it and keeping it inside the temple for 15 days before beginning of Fagli festival during February. On the last day of Fagli, the Gurus perform rituals, propitiate the directions and remove the earth from the temple and examine it and then distribute amongst the people. Things like seeds, stones, threads, saffron are found in this earth mold, although it is sieved before. This decides the fortune of the landscape in the region. Seeds indicate good agricultural yield. Stones indicate a drought. Saffron indicates more marriages and so on. This lady Hira is showing the, uh, uh, trying to search for indications in the little amount of 
submit to you or what she has received from the guru of the temple. The questions asked to the guru during these rituals are usually related to conduct of rituals, well-being of people, and mainly fortune of the land. Here is another example of Devkil, where during festivals, uh, gurus perform in ecstasy and establish the communicate with God, communication with gods. Uh, then generally the issue then generally the issues related uh, to the um, village administration, land monitoring, misconduct by villagers are also brought forth here. In this particular image on the left, uh, uh, ruts of different deities are shown. These ruts start running, moving, shaking, jumping once they come near each other. It is believed that it is the manifestation of the meeting of divine energies. Uh, Rorich rightly says, I would like to quote here, uh, he explains uh, how this Devkil happens. Uh, palanquins seemed to push them about as if drunk. They staggered around, led by an unknown power. This slide shows the booth where the guru is being asked questions like epidemic, disease, natural calamities, droughts, crops, development activities, disputes in the villages, and so on. Thus, the devta who is communicating through the guru is acting as a protector, he's also acting as an advisor, and he's also acting as a judge. Now, this pooch happens at three scales. Now, uh, here it is important to establish a relationship between the administrative structure of land and the villages, uh, uh, the devta kshetra, and um, uh, 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 the pooch which happens at three different levels. Now, this but in this particular thing, the uh, uh, pooch happens at three scales, which correlate with this administrative structure that we saw earlier. Uh, village level, that is individual or personal or the village level issues are sorted. Uh, uh, it happens at Devta Kshetra level where Bada Devta uh, is revered and uh, collective area level issues such as Small, uh, uh, small dam or hydro projects coming up in that particular area are addressed. And regional level, uh, like it is called as Jagati Pooch, uh, where all the deities are invited at one single place. And it is a collective regional level issue, such as drought or in the region or epidemic or large scale projects like Himalayan ski village project that have impact on the region are discussed. Now let's see who organizes all these activities. It's the Devta committee, who also, who is also, which is also known as Devri. If, uh, for example here, if uh, I'm a villager and I want to discuss a health issue in my house, I'm required to take an appointment with the Devta through the Kardar or Pujari and then plan a pooch. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, this does not happen in the temple, but always happens in open landscape. These sacred sites are fixed, such as sacred groups, or community area in the temple premise or a public area in the village. Thus, this Devri is the institution that carries out all these religious activities as per standard norms. Some of these members are uh, hereditary, some are elected, and some are selected by Devta. Who is selected by Devta? Most positions are honorary and ensue, uh, ensue social status. Here, there are a uh, few images of Devri performing their role. For example, uh, Jamani are responsible for carrying the rath. Bajantri is responsible for music. Purohit carries out specialized rituals. Boti, uh, Boti prepares the food or prasad for the villagers. Pujari performs the daily rituals. Guru communicates with the god. And it is important to note that this, uh, this committee has representation from all the castes. Uh, uh, here is an example of Devta administering the land dispute. Uh, this came from the fieldwork as well as a literary study. Uh, uh, when they now to understand this, how this happens, uh, when Devta's rut moving in the in the landscape, uh, uh, if, if Devta finds something illegal, the rut automatically is pushed towards that structure or development, and the rut bangs its poles into the same, indicating uh, the need for demolition. So uh, here I give this example uh, uh, from um, uh, Lucchesi's work and uh, uh, of course my field work also. Uh, this is like um, uh, 
in Vash uh, in Vashishta and Hidimba uh, Devdas, uh, they were they identified unauthorized structures in the core of the town and were made to demolish them within two years span. So the story goes to find the reason behind constant mishaps in the family. Devta Vashishta and Devi Hidimba visited two houses and confirmed that the two structures under consideration were built on someone else's land. These deities found some other buildings to encroaching in the right of way. These were demolished by angry devtas. Similarly, in Vashishta, unauthorized stalls and markets and two structures above the well on the west side of the temple were demolished by angry devta. Finally, the house of the priest came under the attack. Reasons given for this were the supposedly illegal extension of the Western Front uh, and the new windows introduced in the wall on the upper stories overlooking the women's hot water, water uh, bath tank. The protesting priest was arguing by emphasizing his faithful service towards uh, throughout the year. But in the end, finally, they asked, uh, uh, the villagers asked that uh, priest himself should carry the rath. And he himself, finally, when he carried the rath, he himself pushed the poles of the rath into his own house. And this was an evidence that human mechan mechanicians and village politics were not at play, but rather the sister himself had taken the action. Now, in this particular study, uh, uh, I do not look into why, how, true, or false, but uh, I take this as a fact and that this happens, and hence it affects the, how it affects the landscape. In this case, the devta has performed the role of authority, which executes the development control rules in the village. Now, let's go back to the project from where this entire discussion began. What is Jagati Pooch? Pooch is conducted every year to know the yearly fortune of the region. Jagati Pooch is also held in, the, in case of emergency to resolve any larger disputes. All the devtas around 360 in, present in the Kulu Valley are invited at Jagati Pat in Nagar Castle. Majority of the devtas, that is the Gur, is considered for the final decision. Such emergency pooch was carried out in 1970 during a severe drought. Uh, and then it was carried out during 2006 to seek permission of Devta for Himalayan ski project. It is believed that Pooch provides a mechanism for social communication, conflict management, and dispute resolution. Uh, let's know more about this project. The blue area in the map shows 12 affected panchayat and extent of sacred and cultural landscape elements. They are affected due to this project. Uh, the diagram on the right shows uh, impacts of uh, project and the stakeholders. Uh, the economic, uh, it lists down the economic benefits, environmental implications, uh, livelihood concerns, and cultural and spiritual concerns. And then on the right hand side, it enlists the stakeholders. Now, when you look at economic benefits, it's the annual royalty of 3.5 crores to government of HP, employment generation, and the political parties are the stakeholders. When proposed by Congress and opposed by BJP. Then uh, when you're talking about impact, environmental impacts, uh, environmentalists are the stakeholders and they, they have come up with em environmental impact analysis and uh, uh, the, the threats were deforestation, effect on flora, fauna, so uh, soil erosion, increased risk of floods, slope destabilization, landslides, pollution, air of air and water. Then when we turn to livelihood concerns, the stakeholders are the local communities and the NGOs, where the concerns are diversion of stream of water for drinking and irrigation, access and availability to fuel water, uh, fuel wood, fodder and timber, access to alpine meadows for grazing and medicinal plants, uh, and 12 panchayats were to be affected. And then the cultural implications where the devta is the major stakeholder, uh, that's why this entire discussion here. Uh, it it uh, uh, impacts, it's basically a threat to the sacred natural sites, threat to traditional temples, and threat to existing culture. Here I quote uh, Sheffoliers. He expresses religious rights as directly ecological authority, and hence this justifies involvement of secular politics. 
Now, this shows the timeline of events related to this project. Uh, I'm not going to read through it, but I'll just quickly uh, 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 mention the important ones. It shows that it started in 2004 and MOU was signed during 2005. And immediately in 2006, the Jagati Pooch was carried out and the project was refused by Vekas. Here is a quote from Van Gur that the gods turned this proposal down as it would ruin the local culture by subjecting people to Western influences. Gods projected that this would be a threat to sacred natural sites, traditional temples, and broadly to the existing culture and the pristine nature. This verdict in opposition to the project by Devda actually helped in mobilizing the communities that were being affected. Immediately after the Pooch, local organizations like Jana, Jeevan, Vikas, Samiti, etc. used this verdict to mobilize the communities at a larger scale. They were, there were many things that happened after this, as seen in this particular timeline, but the fact is the project is still shelved and stalled. Thus, Devta played a significant role in stalling the development project of Himalayan ski village, which if realized would have caused environmental hazard, considerable loss to the culture and lifestyle of the people. Religious governance provides a mechanism for community mobilization, conflict management, dispute resolution due to its direct ecological authority in the landscape such as Kudu. These mechanisms are beyond the formal roles and responsibilities of the government agencies that are given uh, the responsibility to manage and administer these areas. And hence, recognizing the significance of religious authority of the institutions is important in conservation of cultural landscape and their environments. Now here, the religious faith, faith in devtas, how it mobilizes uh, uh, the environmental um, conservation. One incidence of Jagati Pooch in 2006 proved to be the stimulus for several others that revolved around the devtas, uh, uh, revolved around the debates of development versus environment in the Kudu Valley. Following this, in 2014 and 2016, such pooch was carried out to take decisions regarding the act against animal sacrifice and maintaining sacrality of religious space in case of Dolpur ground used for Kulu Dashera. Just to give you a little insight here, this question was arised by uh, Dumbal Nag. Uh, uh, he requested for a push because he felt that the sacrality of the uh, Dholpur ground where the Kulu, Kulu Dashera happens was, be, uh, was at stake because there was little development proposed and uh, beautification was planned in that particular area. And that's why the push was um, uh, conducted. Now, also there is an example that uh, um, uh, an infrastructure development project was opposed by Devtas, uh, claiming that the land belonged to Devta uh, in the Jogini forest near Vashishtha temple. Though Devtas, uh, through Devtas, people have managed to bring out issues related to cultural heritage and eco-sensitive sacred sites. Similar examples of contestations in other areas, a similar contestation through community mobilization due to religious reasons is seen at national and international level. Uh, one of the examples we saw yesterday by uh, Borde and uh, 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 was called, uh, was the uh, Sarnamatha uh, story uh, in the East uh, Central India. And then there is one example from uh, hydroelectric electric projects which were stalled on the uh, sacred river Gang, uh, Gang Ganga. It's by uh, Drew and uh, uh, Dry Forest in Zamberi Valley by Byers. So these are all examples of the uh, such uh, conservation attempts to religious governance. Uh, so here I conclude that the land and the divinity are synonymous and hence the sacred lands cannot and should not be handed over for any other purpose. Unlike sacred spaces uh, or space and objects whose boundaries are clearly defined, conceptions of sacred lands are typically abstract and the abstract notions of sacred land are indivisible and must retain intact, must remain intact. This study brings out Pooch to be an apparatus or mechanism that can mobilize communities and contribute towards maintaining the cultural landscape. The territoriality of gods in the 
Kulu Valley is not only limited to their territories and rituals, but has the ability to govern a region that is much larger. Maintaining and respecting sacredness associated with the landscape is the way forward for conservation in cultural landscape. Thank you. Thank you very much for having the journey from the manifestation, visualization, linking with shamanism. I remember one of the lines from the great classic book, which was published in 1956 in French and then translated in 1958 in English, sacred and profane by Marcia Eliade. What he, he used to say that a time will come, people will realize that there is nothing like a boundary, sacred and profane. It is our mind we think like this because Mother Nature is always alive, always ready to give you some blessing. It is your tradition, your view like this. So this way, I think I was so much inspired and received a lot of notes from your lecture that you give me to rethink and uh, expand my own horizon of understanding. So thank you very much, Ashwini Pete, and also together with my very intimate and close co-pilgrim, Kiran Shinde. So thank you, both of you. And now you. I'm proceeding to next one. And uh, may I now invite uh, Dr. Uh, Banani Banerji, who is the principal of Sanganar College of Architecture at Pune. Her interest on research extend to various fields like cultural geography, history of architecture, environmental gerontology, and so on. She has written several research papers and chaired sessions of a number of states, national and international level, and she is the inspiring spirit to understand both sides of the reality, visuality and something what is manifested in the landscape. I met several times Banani and she always inspired me to think something more deeper and deeper. Okay, so now let me request, uh, uh, I say her Bahanji. So let me say now openly Bahanji, let, my, let me now request Banani ji to present your paper. Okay, please. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Thank you. And uh, it's really pleasure and I'm really honored to get this opportunity uh, within this uh, esteemed speakers. Uh, today is my uh, actually presentation is on Hills of Pune. So it is like an epithet which I've given kind of labeled on it is that Taj on Queen of the Deccan and place making for the um, from the past on the hills of Pune. So as you know that it is the ninth populated city in India and uh, located at the most pleasing part of Deccan Plateau in Maharashtra and uh, aptly named as Queen of the Deccan. Primarily, uh, this is for its natural assets like magnificent panoramic hills, meandering river front, uh, then salubrious climate, moderate rainfall, and almost definitely, uh, most importantly, the rich cultural environment of this city. And uh, the Taj of this queen, a number of hill, low and small hill and hill ranges, which are about 600 to 7 meter above main sea level, which is scattered in the city, particularly in the southwestern part, is extending from the Sahyadri range from the west. And these are fondly known as tekris, and an epithet which uh, given in this particular paper as Taj on the Queen to this city's very distinct identity. And this part of these hills, few hills actually have protected urban forests and which are accessed by all. And many hills accommodate cultural troops from the past, even from the prehistoric time actually. And both natural as well as cultural landscape evoke varied activities today. These are actually the natural landscape which are attractive places for its basically elevation because it's very tranquil their traffic noise pollution less yet within the city and it's green paradise because visually pleasant because of its green cover and lungs of the city 
and habitats of biological diversity like for both flora and fauna. There are many trails, abundant quarry, and view of the city, which are actually kind of seen from the hill, hilltops. And these are very favorite pastoral as well as recreational des destination places for various outdoor activities for contemporary lifestyle, like climb, hill climbing, walking on the trails, jogging, exercise, and multiple access trails from neighborhoods around the hills are available to go up to the hill. And few hills are also accessible through vehicular roads. These are visited by people of all ages and gender, both solitary as well as in groups. And today, activism also witnessed in several groups to maintain the forest for afforestation, as well as saving these hills from development, legal development, as well as this encroachment of the slums. And to see the cultural landscape, these are also places for all. And in, Indic, this, in India, we know that nature is symbol of divinity and these natural sites like hilltops are considered as sacred sites. So similarly, Pune Hills are also not only just natural and visual features, they also accommodate remarkable cultural traces from the past, particularly sacred sites, many temples, Aboriginal cult sites, rock cut shrines also could be found on these hills, which are today also very popular. Some of them are very popular religious centers and visited by many people. And most of the most important heritage uh, secret sites of the city of deep religious faith located on these hills, like Parvati Temple, Chatushringi Temple. And we know that placemaking is actually a relatively very modern concept, construct, very urban centric to make places for all. And to a little bit uh, going in detail, it's attract people or make the destination places to come together, resulting in community bond. So Pune citizens are privileged to inherit these green paradises adorned with cultural places to pursue their contemporary life. A culturally rich and economically prosperous city like Pune is presently under threat of urbanization and gradually these hills are engulfed by both legal development as well as infringement of slums. And they're destroying the contour, the physical form of the hills, green cover habitats for biodiversity and making also these cultural treasure probes vulnerable. So many of these hills, as I told before, this have cultural associations since past in successive layers, and which are also supported by cultural landscape, materials, rituals, customs, text, photos, archival records, and of course, from the narratives. With that notion, actually, a retrospective research attempted to explore how people made places on these hills meaningful in the past and which continued as cultural traditions even today. And so this is mainly from sourcing from the literature and substantiated with experts in the field. So I'll go in a phase wise. First is the prehistoric or pre agriculture period era. Here, actually, the uh, most stalwart, multifaceted uh, scholar and uh, writer, actually, Didi Kosambi's few books he has written, where he actually recreated prehistory text for Pune region based on two things. One is the logic of geography and the theory of accumulation from cultural survivals of materials and ritual continuation. And his dialectic analysis says that the two distinct cults emerged. One is the father god cult of Highland or the hills as a pastoral land of uh, pastoral herdsmen. Another is the mother goddess cult of lowland or plain of stock breeding and emerging agricultural community. And these uh, few, uh, uh, even he identified a number of uh, Aboriginal cult sites on these Pune hills and mainly from the assemblage of plenty of these prehistoric microliths, 
uh, near the calcites, which are small two, two to five inch uh, size pebbles of local basalt. And ancient custom of blood, blood sacrifice of original people still in practice, blood sacrifice of animals, which are still in practice. This is one of the calcite, which uh, is at the <coughs> highest point of Pune Hills, of all Pune Hills. It is just behind Law College or Film Institute. And he justified as that it also as an uh, Aboriginal prehistoric father god, uh, god calcite. But it's still, uh, there are some customs practice. One is the red top monolith deity. And most of these uh, places, calcites and some of the temples also, they have this red top monolith deities. And also the blood sacrifice of animals still offered on new moon days. This particular temple is actually women are prohib prohibited to visit. There are more number of calcites which are also found uh, in this on the uh, all these uh, hills. And he actually uh, kind of postulated that upper terrace of the hills were never under plow. So obviously he's originally campsites or and to justify that hilltops as sacred scape. And later, this right one actually is actually shows a temple which uh, many, afterwards, many kind popular deities like Maruti, Hanuman, and Shakti goddesses also added in this temple. Some of them became bigger also. And sometimes they have replaced also monoliths which were actually previously uh, worshipped and uh, continuing the sacrality. And they kept also this kind of uh, these microliths or monoliths just uh, somewhere either in the Garbhagriya or like a place like in the this particular temple, which has got uh, the uh, replace the deity or with the idol. Next, I'll go to the uh, phase which actually kind of uh, from agriculture to uh, this assimilation of culture in the Western uh, Deccan. So here actually, if we see the agriculture uh, from agriculture to agriculture, so assimilation of two cults actually, which was uh, represented by the divine marriage of father God and mother goddess cult. Next comes the, uh, comes the urbanization, Mauryan rule, which uh, actually happened in the coastal Maharashtra and Buddhist monks came from uh, the 250 uh, BC. Then the Sadhvahana's 300 years rule where urbanization, early urbanization is marked by the trade routes and trade centers in this region. And the Dakshinapath, the ancient trade, the southern trade route, which did not pass through Pune, but and there are Buddhist rock cut caves, which has again close connection between the trade routes. And uh, there are some unfinished caves of late Him Hinayana period found along the slopes of few Pune hills. And this probably this select uh, this and they selected the preaching their uh, Buddhist preaching sites near the prehistoric uh, spots probably to preach nonviolence and to stop custom of blood sacrifice and maybe also for some kind of spiritual forces. Next uh, layer, what we see is kind of organization or Brahmanization where primitive, this aboriginal, aboriginal non-Aryan cults gradually started melting and absorbed in the dominant Brahminical uh, cultures and uh, introduce new gods like Shakti mother goddess around Aboriginal Kal sites, which can be seen in Parvati or Chatushingi temples. And the next layer, we see that rising popularity of Shaiva Pashupata Kals, which diffused Buddhist practice and patronages, converting uh, some Buddhist caves to Sh Shiva temples or Shiva shrines. Even in Pune also, we find that these cave temples of Shiva in Pune Hills. So this is one of the uh, Shiva temple, which uh, in Baneshwar temple at Baneshwar. These are lesser known places, even not, made, but these people, it's uh, kind of daily uh, regular worship is done. And people also visit uh, climbing a number of steps 
and it's also near um, aboriginal mother goddess called tukai mother temple the other one is right in the heart of the city on parbusan uh, hill just behind the college so we have a group of this unfinished crude caves could be seen and one of this cave which probably was a vihara and which has been later is converted into shiva temple and uh, these are very surrounded by very kind of dense uh, slums very kind of uh, again as lesser known places but it's uh, very popular in that particular slum and that particular area next phase so next layer we are going into the islamic maratha and peshwa period how the hills were actually kind of getting associated uh, so islamic in during that period in 15th century pune was a garrison post under babmani rulers in the deccan next uh, is a maratha period when pune came to shahji father of great maratha king shivaji now here role of hills in the martial tradition emerged with hill forts around pune many hill forts could be found around pune but this low pune hills probably did not satisfy the parameters for strategic planning planning so hill forts were not built next the peshwa period when the power shifted to the peshwa the administrator of the maratha king pune became the capital of pan maratha kingdom and this is a time when bhakti bhakti cult also enlightened the spiritualism during in this region and hills were considered as abode of god and marvelous temples of on the hills of pune were built by these peshwas on the quite a few on the ancient those kal sites and these uh, temples have remarkable heritage values today this is a main or uh, the most important heritage site as uh, parvati temple which was built in the 18th century by peshwa as a temple complex where a temple mansion or vara means that a mansion for the peshwa also was built and white steps which are also built here means now it is definitely improved but uh, to ride on uh, elephant back this was a retreat for change but at, at the same time it was also a lot of a number of secret political negotiations took place in this vara and on the special days many people came and it's very interesting it is also a dakshina grant a learning center for promoting uh, promoting sanskrit which also started over here which later on actually uh, shifted or turned to deccan college the city's first institute which actually sown the seed of status of knowledge center of the city this is the other temple on the hill it's a, uh, again same and during peshwa period but it was built by a banker on a old shrine near a pass called ganesh kin and probably over a collapsed buddhist cave actually if it is from outside it cannot be understood but uh, from literature when i saw it uh, when i read it and i went inside in the garbhagriha it it shows that could be actually it is there is a, there was a kind of collapsed cave and uh, partly it was actually the um, rear wall was uh, of the kind of cave uh, remains and this also very uh, a very major pilgrimage center where uh, navratri festivals are celebrated with vigor every year next uh, go, going to the colonial period but before going to colonial period a small story between the uh, the kind of you can see the relation between two hills parvati and chaturshringi hill is about uh, captain dabs diary which uh, Uh, in history of maratha where he written about the battle of kharki or kharki the anglo maratha war which marked the end of peshwa period and beginning of the colonial period so he watched this battle and battlefield was here which is part of it is now pune university from chaturshringi hill somewhere in the from the chaturshringi hill where the uh, british uh, partial british infantry was also stationed and in this parvati hill the other side peshwa bajirao he also was seen uh, 
watching the battle, same battlefield, almost 10 kilometer away, probably through a telescope. And uh, that seat is on the parapet, is still there actually. So up in this colonial period, Pune, uh, the hills were neither place of abode of gods or nor the martial uh, vantage location. Rather, Pune hills could be actually chosen not for passive retreat, but as an active commanding post. And hill, but interestingly, hills remained as passive panoramic background in their paintings, in their photographs, illustrations, which are extremely valuable archival documents now. Other side, we see the during this same period nationalist movement and how these Pune hills also get kind of connected to it. Pune becomes one of the hotspot of uh, for training young freedom fighters. And hills were the hideouts for secret meetings, practicing shooting, practicing even stone throwing also. <clears throat> and uh, national, this national modern institutes like uh, the Ferguson College, which was started by the group, uh, led by uh, uh, Tilak, Mahamani Tilak then, and many other institute also kind of came up at the food hills. Uh, which actually kind of elated the status of the city to Oxford of the East. Even Gokhale, Gopal Krishna Gokhale also took the, um, took the kind of uh, oath of on the hilltop for starting the, um, the this uh, servant of India that to uh, work for the people. And uh, post independence, it's uh, this Taj of the Queen, which uh, what is the kind of now what we see as city grew in demographically as well as geographically. Techries are very major physical barrier when it started actually localities and all, but it remained as common physical and visual feature. Place making in existing and new places on the hills connected people from all parts of Pune. And Tekris and he'll provide a range of places as active place, massive place, social, historical, heritage, sacred. And Taj of the Queen started with this, like James, these sacred sites or deep religious faith, which are actually situated in on this hill. And journey through this nature or the hill forest further enhanced the spiritual experience. And I'm sure that which we are right now kind of uh, deprived of because of the situation, COVID situation, and very soon this, again, people will be able to go and experience that. And as uh, Ranaji rightly said that the landscape is sacred because human perceive it as sacred and in that ancient past and con continue that by understanding that and uh, to, to the successive generations, of course, with the degree varies. And this is the end of this uh, presentation. And thank you very much for the team Atla for calling and uh, inviting me. Okay, thank you very much for giving this whole uh, like tour and we have tried to uh, do our co-pilgrimage with you in the whole area, different ritual sites, etc. So, let me say metaphorically, um, in terms of manifestation, that this session was just like hexagram. So four directions, four deviants, the four feminine divide, divines in the four corners, and the two male energy, one up and one down. Gallon, of course, it means basement, and joy, it means the last, what you receive, sublime bliss. Okay, so this was a wonderful, invisibly, indirectly combination of the hexagram. It started from heritization, what Galen has talked, then the Indian cultural landscape, the whole conceptual frame, critique of the UNESCO, and then coming up to the local perspective, then using something high technology, geospatial approach, then taking into the ancient uh, Sacral landscape, how to be visualize, how to be understand, how to be scientifically try to link. So here we remember Fritz Jof Capra's saying, it is your perspective that you can say that this is different from that. Okay. 
So one of his famous saying from the famous book Tao of Physics, what he tried to end the book that uh, based on the Tao philosophy, that it is your perspective to see that. So science, the, uh, let me quote like this, science does not need mysticism. Mysticism does not need science, but we human beings need both. And that is the way what uh, Jai Dada has tried to put this whole thing linking together. It was not only individual paper, but it was something like linking all together and great inspiration. Then coming to a new dimension to think about the inherent messages through shamanism and the cultural roots presented by Asuni Bethe together with Kiran Shinde, which was unique in this sense. And then uh, last, Banani has tried to give out uh, the whole passage of Cold Pilgrimage. So this way, I think that was wonderful to link this whole uh, hexagram and complete that. Hexagram is a just example of one of the tantric design, you know, the core of that tantra, Vija, what we call Vija mantra like this. So I think uh, uh, anybody uh, want to say something in a very short time because we all are hungry in Indian chart. We have to cook and have food also and then prepare for the next. Okay? So something passing a remark, if you think like that. The house is open for any discussion and observation. Short. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. I think uh, this is an incredible effort only possible by, you know, someone like you. And of course, with the blessings of Mar, Arnapurna and Kashi Vishwanath, of which you are a living representative. And uh, I was also enjoying uh, the paper by Dr. Ashwini. You know, I was listening to the intonations of shamanism. I'm learning about shamanism more and more in my coming days. And, uh, you know, the, something which connects the whole of Eurasian, the Turan Highlands. Mm -hmm. And especially the last paper by Dr. Bonani was so simple and so you know, grounded, especially in terms of uh, uh, the simple, sacred cultural landscapes, you know, the natural elements, it was coming evident again and again. So, and of course, the papers before I have talked about that. So it's an excellent uh, morning, a morning. It's almost like, almost like the beginning of the lunch. <laughs> so that's good. Then now we can enjoy our lunch in a much better way, having a spiritual spirit. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I just yeah. want to say I love with all uh, uh, with Banani's talk. You know, it made me uh, go to Pune. You know, I've heard a lot about Pune, but I think it really needs to understand the space and place which I had in my mind. But going and seeing in person, it's such a rich uh, history, and I think it's very inspiring. Uh, Professor Joy Sain's talk has uh, inspired me to go back and reread my history, you know. That's what I have taken my few words, but it's very inspiring. Uh, I heard uh, Kiran Shande's talk yesterday as well. So, it was, Shikha, you really nailed it, you know. You really tell us what's going on behind the scene, you know, which we understand as scholars and, you know, what we're missing in the data. But you guys are really the one who are, you know, making it happen, you know. With, so that's really bringing it on the world page. And did I miss anyone? Yeah, I think it was lovely uh, listening everyone and going back inspired, you know. So, and I didn't even have to buy a ticket to India, right? So <laughs> that's what I was thinking. And I have met everybody here. So this was so yeah. lovely. So thank you, Ranaji, and uh, both Ranaji. So thank you so much. It was lovely meeting such a beautiful audience and, you know, and very well organized. I loved it. I just loved it. So thank you. Now I can relax thank and you, sleep, <laughs> but it was really cool. Uh, thank you so much. I've seen some chat by Professor Shikha. Uh, if she wanted to give uh, some observation. Well, I, I, I really enjoyed all the presentations today. It was a very engaging session. And uh, thanks to you and Professor Rana and um, Joy Sen's presentation was I wish there was more time and each of the map was bigger and full slide, you know, to understand the depth of that presentation. And even others like Ashwini was very, very well researched. So excellent session about you know the Pune one and on Ujjain. All were like great insights. So thank you everyone. It was really nice meeting you all here. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, 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 Dr. Kiran, you want to add something? 
No, I, I, I'll not come between you and your lunch. So I'm <laughs> going to be very... <laughs> 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 I think, uh, but incredible effort, I must say. Uh, it's just uh, great to see the variety. I think uh, you're the living testimony to this whole idea of cultural landscapes because the diversity is so much. I mean, you pick up any, any place and it's so much of culture embedded into it and you can start unpacking all of that. I think you've started a fantastic series on, uh, on the premises of ACLA uh, to give voice to these kind of landscapes. Uh, that's the big thing. I think I, I'll go back to Dallin's comment earlier that enough of the monumentalist uh, heritage that we've been talking about, it's time to go back small and go back to our rural uh, and regional areas to unpack a lot of culture. Thank you. Happy lunch. Thank you. Happy okay, lunch. thank you. <laughs> we, we, we can see Professor Satish Kumar and uh, Professor Gitanjali is here, but uh, uh, they are soon going to join in the next session. So maybe we can take some observation in the next session. Thank you so much. And uh, have a nice dinner, dinner, Dr. Kiran. I'll be off now. Thank you. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a great, uh, it's, a, it's a Sunday, but I, uh, my family, if I don't go back, my cultural landscape will. I have to go back. Okay, thank you, everyone. Right. Thank you. Okay, okay. Bye bye. 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 Bye.